Good morning and welcome. I'm Marguerite Cotto. I serve here at the college as Vice President for Lifelong and Professional Learning. It is my pleasure and that of the college teams that are here to welcome you to the Great Lakes campus here in Traverse City. You are in the Haggerty Center. And about 20 years ago, this site was redeveloped for this morning in particular. For you, as community members, as citizen learners, as elected officials, as scientists, as researchers, as curious individuals, to come together to exchange ideas and views and commitment to that that great thing. We will have to close the screens for the PowerPoints, but we had to open them for this morning. So let me begin with some housekeeping for those of you who have not yet discovered the path to the restrooms. Down at the end toward this long corridor towards your left, and if you follow the water side, you will find those on your right on the other side of the um, Great Hall. And uh, safety exits are always clearly marked, including those behind you in case of any type of um, impropriety in the building. Um, and then some housewarming. I'd like to thank two teams that are here in particular. They get here very early to set up. So to the Haggerty team, thank you as always. And to the team from Leah, they are doing the Up North Live uh, videography for this. We will be streaming live on Facebook. And so I would like to remind you that for the Q&A and other commentary that may be here, there will be microphones. And so resist the temptation to simply project. Use a mic so that those at home can hear your questions and hear those discussions. So thank you for that. And so why are we here? That was a question that was asked to my dear colleague, Constanza Hazelwood, who's the educational coordinator for the Great Lakes Water Studies Institute, asking the college why it was sponsoring this event this morning. We are here because this matters and we're stewards, and we have been so since the beginning of the college. But let me share you a stewardship story that we also share with our students um, at whatever place we may find them on campus. And so it's about 100 years ago, and I was having this thought driving in this morning, that a physician wrote a letter to the editor in the Record Eagle concerned about the human health issues of the condition of this bay, which was the recipient of black water for the entire community that, of course, built its buildings not to face the bay. And so when I am darkly concerned about what lies ahead for the future of water, I look out at the bay. And as I tell our learners, I look out there because it is the question raised at the right time by a citizen observer, a doctor. Can there be a better way that leads to many conversing together that leads to action, small and simple steps that in our community connected commerce, industry, elected officials, scientists of the day, and most importantly, citizens like you and I, at home, in our yards, grassroots. And so our grandchildren Today, you and I look at this, new people come to this community every day as they will this year, and look at this in awe of pristine water. And you and I know, and this conference focuses on the seen and the unseen, that would say, it's not pristine, it's what we protect and restore. So thank you all for being here, thank you all for your work, we have a wonderful and remarkable collection of folks speaking and sharing technical, scientific, and common sense information with you. We're pleased to welcome colleagues from the University of Alberta and Oakland University and others there and all our Great Lakes colleagues. So thank you and let's begin the conference. Thank you for that warm welcome. 
My name is Rob Carner. I'm the watershed biologist for the Glen Lake Association. And today, I see in this room a bunch of movers and shakers and high-level thinkers. Amen to that? Amen. Raise your hand. Come on, man. So I'm uh, privileged to be able to introduce our first speaker, is Tom, Dr. Tom Raffle. You know, in the swimmer's itch world, we've been focusing on the northern half of the tip of the mid and even in the UP. But we had this past year a chance to look at the southern half of the lower peninsula and Tom did a fantastic job looking at the distribution and abundance of snails and pathogens with regards to swimmer's itch. So let's give a warm welcome to Tom Raffle. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Rob. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. So, uh, so I'm here to uh, talk a little bit about the statewide distribution of this parasite. Um, I think historically there's been a lot of focus on uh, the, the northern corner of the Upper Peninsula, and um, we, uh, this past year we were really interested in seeing what's going on uh, further south. And I think we found some really interesting uh, results. So uh, just to start out with, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think most of you are aware of most of this stuff. Uh, so swimmer's itch is a, uh, it's, it's obviously, it's a problem uh, in uh, Michigan Inland Lakes, also uh, really all throughout the temperate zone. And uh, it's caused by uh, parasites we call avian schistosomes. So these are related to the kinds of parasites that cause human schistosomiasis in, uh, in Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, but normally these guys infect birds. It's in different uh, clade. Uh, most of them are in the genus Trichobilharzia rather than the schistosoma. And so, uh, so these parasites, they're trying to complete their life cycle in birds. Uh, a, a lot of them are going for ducks or, or wading birds. And they, uh, uh, birds are a lot like us. They're warm-blooded and they've got similar kinds of chemicals in their skin. And so the parasites, uh, they, they detect us and they make a terrible mistake and they try to infect us. And of course, they're not going to complete, complete their life cycle, but they can cause problems. So uh, every one of these little itchy bumps that this guy has, uh, each one of those is a spot where a stricaria tried to penetrate its skin. Um, so this causes an itchy rash and it's, uh, it's, it's very annoying and uh, potentially, uh, it's potentially a health problem uh, over long term. Um, so that we know that there are quite a few different uh, types of snails that play host to this parasite and uh, the biggest focus of our uh, work has been on the distribution and abundance of these potential snail hosts. Um, so back in 2016, my group did a survey of, uh, of 16 different lakes. This is all up in the, this uh, upper northern region of, uh, of Michigan. And we managed to recruit a large number of volunteers. Uh, I think there are some, some of those volunteers are actually here in this room. Um, we, uh, we sampled at 38 sites on 16 lakes. And importantly, uh, we had an individual citizen scientist at every site, and they were collecting daily uh, water samples and filtering them so we could do quantitative PCR and detect cercaria in the water. So we were able to get uh, an integrated uh, measure over a whole month of samples. Um, and uh, we also were sampling snails and we measured uh, about 50 or 60 different environmental predictors um, that we thought might be important. And we came up with just one that was really, really important. And it's kind of the obvious one, but uh, I think it, it bears mentioning that the, by far and away the best predictor of circadian abundance in these particular lakes was uh, this one particular species of snail. So these are snails, we've been calling them uh, Stagnacola marginata. In literature, it, it's uh, Limnea catascopium. And so these uh, stag Stagnacolid snails are really, were really the best predictor of, uh, of avian schistosome abundance at these lakes. So that's, uh, that's good to know. Um, we also found that these snails were more abundant in the deeper, colder lakes. And we found more of them in, uh, uh, at local sites that had more shade. So all of this makes a lot of sense. This is a, this is a snail. It's, a, uh, it's essentially um, a subarctic uh, genus of snails, and, or at least group of snails. Uh, these guys are mostly found in colder areas. They're typically found in deeper water, uh, colder parts of the lake. And uh, so all of the different things that we found uh, related to the snail um, probably have something to do with temperature and their preferred habitat. Now there were some sites that had cercariae, but they had uh, very few host snails at the local site. And 
Uh, we think that the, one of the things that this is indicating is that there's a lot of circaria being brought in from off-site, right? So we know these snails are found in really deep water, and we know that the circariae have a behavior where they swim to the surface, they're phototactic, so they go towards the light, and once they're up on the surface, they can be moved around by water currents, and they live for about 24 hours, so they can move pretty long distances if you've got a water current going. And so this is, I, I think this is an important point because we had a secondary predictor that was, uh, that was highly significant, uh, which was a negative effect of submerged vegetation at the local site. And so we think most plausibly this might be due to uh, floating plants acting as a barrier to keep uh, preventing circaria from moving in from offsite if you've got an onshore current. Uh, some additional information backing this up, and this was uh, actually uh, published this month in Parasitology by my uh, PhD student Jason over there. So, uh, so we did a, uh, an analysis of uh, data that lifeguards at, uh, at uh, C, uh, Christian Summer Assembly, is that right? CSA, uh, Crystal Lake. They've been collecting uh, daily data on swimmers itch incidents at this one beach for years. And so they, uh, they, they offered to let us analyze the data uh, very generously. And they also had data on wind direction and wind speed, which they thought was really important. It came out as being super important. Um, a little bit surprisingly for us, uh, the direction of wind had to be exactly perpendicular to the shoreline. If it was even the slightest little bit off, then you didn't get the same kind of an effect. So we think what's happening here is you have to have a directly perpendicular water current being set up. Now, uh, these results might differ uh, depending on the site that you're at and the, the local hydrology. So in this case, there's, uh, there, there's this kind of broad, very gentle curving uh, uh, morphology to this shoreline, and so we think that, that direct, those direct water currents are bringing those circaria on site. So based on this uh, series of studies, we thought, okay, it seems like we've got uh, a general story in these uh, northern Michigan lakes. If you've got a deeper lake, you're probably going to have more of these stagnant snails out in deeper water, and uh, Possibly they're more likely to move up into shallow areas if, it, if there's nice shade to keep it cool locally. Um, and then furthermore, if you've got onshore wind, that might further increase the risk on a, any particular day. All right, so, so we had all this information about northern Michigan, and we wanted to know what's happening in other parts of Michigan. Now there was a lot of, uh, there's a lot of clues in the literature that it might be very different in other parts of Michigan. So uh, we came across, there's a, a historic uh, data set published in the 1940s. Uh, so this is getting to be, uh, uh, you know, 80 years out of date. They had surveyed a huge number of lakes, uh, 127 lakes, 511 sites, and uh, all over the, the state, including the Upper Peninsula. And um, so they had found, basically, that these stagnant colid snails were only found in this northern part of, uh, of Michigan. Uh, they, they weren't really found at all in southern Michigan or even in the central Cadillac region. Uh, meanwhile, there's uh, another type of limnaid snail that is known to play host to the same species parasite, and Limnaeus stagnalis. And so this one's found a little bit more widespread, quite a lot in the C Cadillac region. The other known host snail uh, locally was these physid snails. And this appeared to be, in this data set, the most important host in southern lakes. Now, I want to point out that we're, um, we're finding now that there's an important, potentially important species that comes from Helosoma snails. Historically, Helosoma snails weren't even checked. No one, no one bothered looking at Helosoma snails. So there's no historic data for Helosoma snails that we've been able to find. Um, OK, so we had this uh, 2016 data set up here. And these are the green sites. Uh, for this past year, we sampled all throughout the rest of Michigan. Those are all these uh, blue sites. And once again, we got uh, local help identifying good sites uh, from uh, local landowners. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on, primarily on our snail density data. So we uh, did visual quad dot surveys. This is a, a view bucket. It's a kind of a, a, a low-tech way of being able to count snails in quadrats. Uh, so you just toss that out and then you go and count how many snails are in there. Uh, there were some lakes, especially in southern Michigan, where the water wasn't super clear. The, there was a lot of 
uh, uh, the sediment was easy to stir up, so it was really difficult to do visual quadrant surveys. And so there, there we did, uh, uh, this is a standard method in uh, pond ecology, which is pipe sampling. You jam a pipe into the sediment, and then you keep scooping until you stop getting anything, basically. All right, so we had two ways of getting this density data. Now, uh, we also uh, ended up teaming up with uh, uh, Ron Reiming's group, uh, the Reiming and uh, Hannington uh, groups, and they had uh, collected some additional uh, snail samples up in some of these northern Michigan lakes, and you're going to hear about more of that uh, a little bit later. Their methods were comparable, though, at least with respect to the, uh, the area uh, uh, in the water or on, on, the, on the bottom. All right, so combining these re results together, um, so basically, we, we found more or less what we expected with the limnaid snails, but if anything, they're, they're even a little bit further north than we thought. And so uh, we, we found virtually no limnaid snails of either species in the southern half of Michigan, with one exception where during a collection we found, I think it was two individual snails in the most diverse site, which was at Klinger Lake. But uh, other than that, we, we found basically none of these guys. Uh, we did find physid snails mostly in this kind of, so, so up here there were physid snails. We also found physid snails down in this uh, kind of southwesterly quadrant. And then we found uh, quite a few of these planorbid snails, again, lots of them up here, but, but going b down further south into the Cadillac and Ludington regions, and then uh, kind of spread out throughout the, uh, the south. Uh, we also uh, surveyed non-host snails. Um, so uh, uh, both of these have uh, opercula, which is a hard thing. Now that doesn't mean, operculate snails can still be, play host to some trematodes, but they're not known hosts for any of the, any of the schistosomes. Uh, so pleurosurid snails uh, tended to be more abundant uh, at lakes right along the edge of the state. And these guys, it kind of makes sense, these guys are adapted for living in the shallows. They've got super thick shells. They like to live in a breaker zone with rough water. Um, and then in this kind of middle section of Michigan, we found quite a lot of mystery snails, uh, which are uh, native to North America, but not native to Michigan. Uh, there's a band of mystery snails. Um, so one of the things we were interested in was how snail biodiversity uh, changes across the state. Uh, but I want to focus uh, a little bit more on the, uh, the, the we, we were able to get qPCR data through our collaboration with the Hannington Group, and I want to focus a little bit on how the abundance of the trematodes in the water seems to relate to the snails. So we had two different methods for looking for parasites. Uh, my group, what, uh, we, all the snails that we collected, we screened them overnight, which means you put them in a clear, clean water, a little cup of water. And then uh, in the morning, you look to see if there's any cercaria swimming around in the water. Very low tech. Um, we were able to uh, observe cercaria behavior and get, uh, get specimens that we could stain and mount. Um, and then we also did uh, uh, collected filtered water samples. So we used the, uh, this is the, the Hannington filtration uh, method, which is a little bit different from the method we used in the past. Uh, I think that they're both hopefully perfectly uh, comparable methods, but uh, we had this, uh, it's basically a zooplankton tow net. You, you keep pouring water into it, uh, and you're collecting individual one liter scoops, so you get a distributed sample. And then uh, once it's filtered out, then we, uh, you get it into a small container and add a bunch of ethanol, which preserves the, uh, the DNA. So then we sent those off to uh, Rymink, and uh, they did some qPCR and then sent on the positive samples to the Hannington's group. All right, so one schistosome that was really of interest to us was uh, Trichobilharzia stagnicoli. So most, most, a lot of you have probably heard of this one. This is the one that is uh, brought up the most. It's the one that uh, uh, is largely transmitted by mergansers and that uses these limnaid snails. Um, and uh, so this was one that uh, Ron's group had collected. And the video's not going, so that's kind of sad. Um, anyways. Um, so one question we had was, are we even going to find this in southern Michigan? Because if, it, if it's specific to that one type of snail and we don't find those snails, then it, we might not find all that much. Oh, well, there it is. 
Yeah, so they've, they've got a, uh, uh, so, so these avian schistosomes have a particular behavior that's uh, typical of all the schistosomes. They'll, they'll hang in the water. Uh, you, can, you might be able to see some of them, they've got forked tails. Right, Furcocircus cercari is uh, uh, diagnostic to these guys. Uh, they, they also, these are uh, phototactic, so they'll move towards the light, whatever light source you've got. Um, some of the species we thought we, that we might find, uh, since if we're not going to find limnae, oops, if we're not going to find limnaid snails, uh, we thought we might find uh, this. Uh, Physelli is one that's found in physid snails. Um, the uh, Branti was a, a relative. I think it's a recent description um, that uh, that's found in uh, Gyralis. Uh, there, there were a couple other possibilities, and the ones that we are able to test for that that. Uh, uh, Hannington's group was able to test for were this uh, Fizelli, Stagnicoli, Branti, and then this, uh, this new species that they found that uh, is produced by Helisone snails. Um, we did not find any of these guys, so I'm going to focus on, on these three. All right, so in our, uh, in our actual screening, we did find some uh, Furcocircus cercariae, uh, and we, uh, we got one, one from a helosome snail that appears to be an avian schistosome. Um, and so this is a, a video of that guy. You can see it's got a similar kind of behavior, but uh, they're, they're a little bit smaller uh, size than, uh, than the uh, stagnicoli. And so we thought, okay, well, this is a poss possible avian schistosome, so, so we're going to probably submit vouchers for this one. Uh, we also got some other Furcocircus cercariae that, um, you know, initially looked promising, but you look a little closer, and they're actually Vivax cercariae, so these don't cause uh, swimmer's itch. And these were all coming from uh, the operculate snail. Um, also, I think just really briefly, it's worth pointing out that the vast majority of cercariae that we saw were, uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the, I guess we were referring them to them as tumblers. Is that what you guys called them? Tumblers? All right, because of the, the way they swim. Uh, actually, uh, before I worked on uh, avian schistosomes, I used to work on, on echinostomes uh, infecting amphibians. So I'm, I'm really familiar with these guys. We also got a, quite a few amphistomes, which have larger cercariae. Uh, I think it's important to note that you know, you, 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 just because you're getting cercariae doesn't mean you're getting swimmer's itch causing cercariae. All right. So, uh, so these are the sites that we have qPCR data from uh, for. Uh, 2018 and 2019, the 2018 data were uh, all from, uh, from Ron's group, collected up here, and then these were our sites. Um, so uh, so the, the remaining maps are going to be focusing on these sites where we have qPCR data. Um, so there's a, uh, it's called the, the pan, panavian schistosome assay. This is, uh, it, so uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, qPCR assays are detecting particular genetic sequence, right, that is specific to a particular group, and you can design the, the called primers that are targeting that sequence so that they will uh, only amplify uh, organisms within a particular group. And depending on how exactly you design them, you can make them more or less specific. So this is a less specific assay. It'll amplify DNA from any schistosome, including the human schistosomes, uh, which I don't really find around here. So, uh, so this is kind of total avian schistosome cercariae. And so as you can see, like, there's clearly a ton of it up here, which we knew. Um, but there were also quite a few sites down south where we got quite a few cercariae, right? And uh, I think, uh, in particular, we had uh, quite a few sites um, right in uh, Oakland County, which is where we are, uh, that, are, that we actually found lots of cercariae in the water. Uh, despite the fact that uh, we had found no limnaid snails. So uh, they also, uh, so Patrick's group has generated primers that are specific to particular species of these treatment toads. So uh, this was the result of the assay that's specific to the Stagnicoli parasite. And as you can see, they're, they're mostly clustered up in the region where we do find those limnaid snails. All right, so this is very consistent with what we expected. We, just we only found uh, a couple spots where we picked this up at all, um, which may indicate there could be some stagnant cold snails there. I guess it's all, it's, there's also a, a chance of a false positive, but um, it's probably less likely with this site. 
Uh, this was uh, T. Fizelli. Uh, so again, found uh, more of it up north, which is where we saw more Fizes and snails, but down in the southwestern region, we did get a hit. Now, the one where we really got quite a lot in the south was this new species that is produced by helosome snails. So this is the one that no, no one's been screening helosomes in the past. No one has suspected helosomes are producing this. It looks to me like it's a problem up north, and this is possibly the only one that's a big problem in the south. So, uh, so clearly, we need to learn more about this species of parasite. These are, I mean, these are lakes with high, high human population density around them. This is a potentially a highly impactful parasite species. Uh, and I think, uh, I, for my money, this is this is I, was I think the most dramatic result. I should mention we only got these results at, like in the last week or two, uh, uh, so just in time for this presentation, we got the most interesting results. All right. Um, okay. So some conclusions. So uh, so first off, um, our suspicion was correct. Everyone's suspicion was correct. The snail community is very different in these southern Michigan lakes. Um, the limnaid snails that, uh, that are so important up here uh, are barely present in most of these southern lakes. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm suspicious that there may have been a little bit of a northward shift. I think that's worth uh, doing a little more investigation and seeing if we can get access to the, the original data, uh, which we think uh, from that 1940s study, we think it might be buried somewhere in the state archives. Uh, so we'll see if we can get access to that. Um, the Fizet and Planorbid snails are abundant in the north and in the south. Interestingly, we found very few schistosome-producing snails in those mid-latitude lakes. Right? They, they, there was very little there. Um, and I find it interesting that those lakes were also where we found a lot of mystery snails, the banded mystery snails. There's a chance that there may be some competitive dynamics between these snails, and I think, uh, I think that would be something that's really worth uh, following up on. In terms of cercari abundance, it was much higher in those northern and southern lakes. Again, not as much in those mid-latitude lakes, and that's consistent with snail distributions. Uh, the species-specific distribution is correlated with the distributions of their known host snails, uh, which is uh, both reassuring that it seems like what we're doing is it, it works, but it also helps to uh, kind of verify that these are probably fairly host-specific parasites. And we know, uh, evolutionarily speaking, that that uh, trematode parasites tend to be more host specific for the snail part of the life cycle than any other part of the life cycle. So this is, uh, this is something that I would have expected. Um, and then last, this, this new species of helosome transmitted schistosome, which is still nameless, uh, but really needs a name because I think it might be one of the most important parasites for uh, causing, uh, causing swimmer's itch in Michigan, and especially in southern Michigan. All right, so a couple take-home messages. Uh, swimmer's itch isn't just a northern Michigan story. It's also important in southern Michigan. Uh, and we really need to learn more about the biology and ecology of this new parasite species. Um, I have to acknowledge a huge number of people. Uh, so these were all uh, people that helped uh, get, get us access to sites and went out and collected those daily water samples in 2016. It's a huge number of people. Um, every one of these lake associations helped to fund that study uh, to the tune of something like $2,000 a, a lake, which, fr frankly, most of it was funded by like, my, my startup and PA lines and so on. But, uh, but it was a huge help. We wouldn't have been able to do the study without that support. Uh, these were our, our, all our local contacts for this past year. So, uh, so a big part of doing a study like this is just the amount of time you spend going out and uh, making contact with people and, and, and cultivating those relationships. And so my, uh, my students were hu huge in that. I, the, we had uh, two students on our, our team this summer, Melissa Ostrowski and uh, Devin Romano, and they, they spent a lot of time going around and, and, and talking, uh, talking on the phone with people and visiting. Um, this is, uh, this is all, all the people that, that helped to work on this project in my lab and in uh, Rhyming's group and the Hannington lab. And uh, are we taking questions later? How's that working? Later? Okay. So no questions. Sorry. <laughs> thank, thank you very much for the... Oh.
I, I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to come and present. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. I want to take us through a history lesson from 1928 to 2017. Strap on your seat belts because it's going to go fast. I get 10 minutes. So in 1928, a guy by the name of William Court discovered the life cycle of swimmer's itch. And we, the elevated humans who have an elevated ego, thought we can control swimmer's itch now. All we need to do is interrupt the life cycle. So you have a snail and you have a bird host. And so in the early thinking, we thought, well, let's kill all the snails. And there was a cheap market on copper sulfate in the day. You could buy it by the ton. It was pretty cheap. It's a lot more expensive now. And we decided, OK, let's take as much copper sulfate as it takes to go to a shoreline and look for snails. We didn't even know what kind of snails. And said, if there's snails in this area, let's put some copper sulfate in it. The complicating factor was that people were donating money for copper sulfate. And so when you donate money, you probably want it on your shore whether you have snails or not. <laughs> so there was this tension between putting copper sulfate in the water to kill snails and satisfying our donor base. So I started to think about my career and getting the teaching job at the Leland Awe School back in 1977. And I went to the University of Michigan Biological Station for three years. Got to know a guy by the name of Harvey Blankerspor, who is really the kind of the father of swimmer's itch in this area. And I heard about his work. I met him at the station. And I kept it in the back of my mind. And at the same time, I was signing up in the summer for a summer job, because I was a teacher, and you have the summers off. So what was I doing as a biologist? Putting copper sulfate in the water for two years. And I started thinking about what in the heck am I doing? I'm putting this heavy metal, copper sulfate, which when it dissolves, turns into an ionic state for about two hours in an area if the wind isn't blowing. And it turns into a toxic compound that kills all the life on the shoreline. And then it precipitates because of the pH of the lake and it goes into a copper carbonate, which makes it inactive. So you tell people who are swimming in an area, OK, can't swim here for two hours till the water clears up, and then you can go back in the water. In the meanwhile, we killed all the snails. So I started thinking in 1983, Dr. Harvey Blankerspor, he must know something about this notion of having a lake-wide approach to controlling swimmer's itch. Lake-wide approach. And so I said, Harvey, why don't you come here and do some research? And he said yes. And he brought Ron with him as well back in 1983. And my goal was to get a ban on having copper sulfate put in lakes. I didn't think it was a good idea because metals accumulate in the sediments. And over time, if the pH of the lake were ever to change, what do we have? A toxic waste dump. And we would have copper coming back into solution, and we would have a problem of, of epic proportions with all that tonnage of hot copper sulfate being put on the lake year after year. But we had to look at it from a different perspective. So Harvey and Ron said, well, why don't we, instead of killing all the snails and putting the copper sulfate in the lake, let's focus on the avian hosts. Well, on Glen Lake, we didn't know which duck or bird, passerine, whatever it might have been, we didn't know what the avian host was, avian meaning bird. So what did we do? We had to go through and in this two-year process, collect poop samples from every bird we could think of <laughs> and analyze it for the part of the life cycle that has the Mericidia in it. We also, at the same time, had to collect all the snails so that this matching process of which snail and which bird could we work on to break the life cycle. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So they did this, but the end of that study showed that we needed to focus on a particular snail that when we later looked at the infection rate, it was one of many snails in our lake that had only a 2% infection rate, which meant if you took the snail that was causing the problem, you collected 100 of them, only two of those snails were contributing to the itch in that shoreline. 
2%. That means we were killing a lot of innocent snails, let alone all the other species that had nothing to do with, with it. So we had another problem, and Ron, bless his heart, he had to figure out a way to do something that no one in the entire world was doing, live trapping and relocating common mergansers. Now, now all ducks are created equal, <laughs> and you have to outsmart a duck that's pretty smart. In fact, as many times, Ron could go a whole day long talking about how he's been outwitted by a merganser. <laughs> so while Ron was trying to figure out how to trap these birds, which nobody was doing, and he had a host of failed experiments that led us to today where we now know how to do it, thanks to him and his ingenuity and hard work, we now know how to trap live mergansers, and so now we had uh, our egos getting in the way of our thinking and said, we can control Swimmer's Itch lake-wide. All we need to do is take the mergansers, common mergansers, off our lake for the summer, and they won't be defecating in the water, and they won't be seeding the snails, and we'll have a reduced amount of Swimmer's Itch risk. And so that was our mindset. And boy, did we have tunnel vision. Tunnel vision, like that's our silver bullet. That's what we do. That was the new paradigm of shifting from copper sulfate to live trapping and relocating common mergansers. And I had a little bit of trouble as the watershed biologist for the Glen Lake Association. I had a target on my back. I had to be careful where I went, which restaurant I went to, what church I had to go to where I talked to somebody. They would say, you're the guy. You are the guy that <laughs> caused this copper sulfate to go away. And you got this new thing that I don't believe is going to work. So people had a second guess on this idea of, hey, copper sulfate was the silver bullet. Now it's the mergansers. Well, stay tuned for the rest of this morning. You're going to find out more about how it's not the silver bullet. So trapping proved to be difficult. We had a situation where the only way you could trap was under a permit that the state had, which was called a scientific collector's permit. That meant that you had to have a professor, a three-year academic study. The costs were high. We had to get this study going, and that was the only way we could take mergansers off our lake because it's a federally protected bird. It's a migratory species, so you can't just handle these birds. You had to have a special permit. Well, later in the uh, 2000s, we got to a point where we said we got to have a regular permit where any lake who wants to do this lake-wide control of swimmer's itch could get a permit to trap and relocate common mergansers. Let me back up a little bit and digress. There was a thought, too, that we could, once we had these live birds in our hands, we could stick a big pill down their throats. <laughs> Prazaquantil, it's a, it's a worming medicine. It's even used by humans in third world countries or developing countries. So this is a pill that you put in the bird. It would release all of the worms out of the digestive tract through the fecal material, but it would only last for so long, and it proved not to be a good way to go. So the drugging of the birds was phased out. This brings us to 2015 to 2017. We had this organization called Michigan Swimmer's Itch Partnership and the DNR. We worked together to make this new permit roadworthy and on the line and it's ready to go for anybody who wants to try to control swimmer's itch. But you're going to find out this morning that if you only take mergansers off the lake, you're not going to solve your problem. So up to and including 2017, all efforts focused on merganser removal turned to spring harassment because remember prior to this getting this statewide permit, we didn't have a permit. From 2010 to 2015, we didn't have any permit. And so what did we do? We went around and harassed. <laughs> we took these uh, screamers and bangers and cherry bombs and shot them out of shotguns to try to scare the birds during the breeding season. We thought if the male and the female were trying to court and they were getting all this distraction on the shore that they wouldn't mate, they wouldn't form a nest, they wouldn't lay eggs, they wouldn't bring chicks. We would have merganser control on a new level. Guess what? <laughs> it didn't work. Those mergansers got so smart 
They'd see the boat coming with the pyrotechnics and they'd be 200 yards away and they'd fly way out of range of being able to scare them. They figured it out. They also figured out all the traps. So we have problems, problems, problems. So in summary, we did the best we could with the science that was available to us to try to make a good lake-wide control program work. We had a couple paradigm shifts that are coming. One was to go from copper sulfate to uh, taking birds off the lake through live trapping and relocating. But we had the onset in 2017. Here we go, I'm almost done. 2017, we had new technologies moving forward at a lightning pace. And what I'm going to tell you right now, from 1928 to 19, or 2210, uh, sorry, 2017, you take all those years, almost 100 years, and you say, how much did we learn? Well, we learned a fair amount, but what we learned in the last two years, three years, is fantastic, and that's what we're going to hear now. So thank you very much. I'm going to introduce now my esteemed colleague and best friend, Ron Rymick. Thank you for coming. Thank you for presenting. This is difficult. Thank you, Rob. Uh, we're lucky to have Rob as a lake biologist here in Northwest Michigan. Uh, I think, as I work on this, I'll do two things at once. Um, I know Rob is the best lake biologist east of the Mississippi, uh, maybe in the whole United States. He's really good. He's been doing it for a long time, and uh, thank you, Rob. We are going to, um, I apologize, this is the first symposium I've ever organized, and I didn't have the schedule printed out for you. So what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about the history 2017-2018. And what do I have to do here? Cancel this? Okay. 2017-2018, um, and then it's going to lead us into 2019. I'll talk about one thing that we did in 2019, and then Patrick, I'll introduce Patrick, and he'll come up and talk about the rest of 2019, and then we'll take a break, 15-minute break. Um, if you need to break before that, feel free to leave. It's not a problem. And then we'll finish after that with um, uh, a paradigm shift, maybe, and then uh, also some community-based monitoring and QPCR and that sort of thing. So anyway, that's where we're at. Um, I think I'm organized here. Rob wanted to have this up, and I apologize, Rob, I didn't have that for you. But if you want to contact him, you have any questions for him specifically, rkarner at lelanau.org. He's a lake biologist at Glen Lake. And you can get a hold of me through Freshwater Solutions or Rymic at Hope, and most of you did, actually, to RSVP. Basic, basic life cycle, just so that I know many of you are, but some of you maybe not quite, but we, have a, we have, usually have a duck or a waterfowl. The worms live there. When the, when the waterfowl defecates in the water, there are eggs. They hatch when they get in the water. This little, there's a couple words you need to know for what you're, to stay with me here. Myricidium. That's the little free-living uh, organism. It lives for a day, and it's looking for a snail. If it hits the snail, it takes about 30 days. And then every day after that, the snail will kick out up to two or 3,000 of these what are called cercari. So that's a word you'll need to know. Cercari is the, is the thing coming out of the snail that is going up to uh, look for a duck. We accidentally, as Tom said, get in the way, and they burrow into our skin, and that's what swimmer's itch is. So Project 17, there were three lakes involved in 2017, Glen Lake, Lake Leelanau, and Lime Lake. And we had, uh, Freshwater Solutions was actually just formed in 2017, and uh, we had a couple of things that we wanted to accomplish. One was to, to reduce costs and improve efficiency. Uh, so what we did, instead of me, I spent m most of my life, adult life, trapping mergansers. Uh, and we said, you know what, we need to, uh, to reduce the costs. Uh, we, the cost in 2015 and 16 was about $20,000 a brood uh, to remove them, and now it's less than $2,000 a brood. Uh, and so what we did is we said we have to take what we know and we have to train others to do that. That frees us up then to do some important science. So we did that, and in doing that we trapped uh, with Joe and uh, Bruce Hood, they're both here, uh, we trapped all the broods on Glen, uh, Lyme, and, and Leelanau in 2017. 
We also, to reduce costs, promoted a new technique, qPCR. Tom talked about that. Uh, in a nutshell, if you still look confused on that, uh, qPCR is a way to take a known volume of water and count the worms. So a known volume of water, we can count the worms in the water, qPCR. And so that's, that's a, a, a direct uh, measure of risk for swimmer's itch. So you, snail infection rate, okay, it tells you what the potential is, but if you're going to go swimming, you want to know how many worms are in the water. Uh, before you go and that so we promoted that and that's also a cost reduction thing and so we developed in 2017 a standard water collection protocol we thought if we're gonna give this and train people to do this we should have a standard so that everybody's doing it the same way so that our data are valid we also promoted community-based monitoring see and we're gonna from now on and you'll see this throughout the rest of the morning uh, CBM so that's really like citizen science. And we recognize, and Patrick is a leader probably in the world on this with qPCR for sure, uh, the power of, of citizen-based science or community-based monitoring. And so we recognize that. Uh, and so we, in 2017, started to educate lake associations about the new technologies, um, especially qPCR, to manage water quality, not just for swimmer's itch, and we're gonna talk about other things today, because some of you are interested in just other water quality things, uh, but the power of CBM. We also, in 2017, wanted to advance swimmer's itch control and prevention science. I do know from working on Glen Lake back in the day when we did remove all the mergansers, and, and some people were saying, this is great, and other people were wanting their copper sulfate back uh, because it didn't work. And so I knew coming into this in 2017 that we have to have a plan B uh, if, if we remove the mergansers and hope that that works, but we need to have a plan B because I remember back in the 80s and 90s, there were people that uh, were not happy because it didn't help them on, on Glen Lake. Um, so we did that. We assessed copper sulfate, and I, I have a couple asterisks by some of these, and that's because on your table, uh, I have the abstract and titles of some of the papers that we've published in the last three years, and that's one of them. We actually assessed the effectiveness of copper sulfate uh, on South Lake Leelanau, a thousand foot uh, section of shoreline where they do it. They've been doing it for years and years and years. We actually found more, with qPCR, we found more worms in the water after they applied the copper. It killed snails. It did a great job, whoops, of killing snails, uh, but uh, the circaria counts were actually higher after the, because of drift in with wind, as, and Tom talked about that as well. We also innovated some novel prevention strategies, which I'm going to talk about uh, after the break. We discovered uh, some unique circari characteristics, which I'll talk about as well. And then we had this event happen, and it actually happened right here in this room. Uh, it, there was a freshwater summit on October 20, and I was here, and so was Jeannie Williams. Jeannie is, Jeannie is here, yeah, right there. And she uh, was presenting some work that she was doing with Inland Seas, and I was sitting in the crowd. And she said, you know, uh, we, we, we we're collecting with their students, we're collecting these fish all around the bays here, and a number of them have these white, this, this, it's actually an ectoparasite on them, and, and, and these, these were happen to be gobies, but she said the small bass are, also have the spots on them as well. And she said, so we started looking around, and we found them there and there, not there, not there. Not there, not there, there, not there, 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 and there. And she said, does anybody have any ideas? And I was sitting out in the crowd, <laughs> and I know that in 2017, the first year that we trapped mergansers, we put 300 mergansers right there. We relocated 300 live mergansers. Wow right there and I was like oh my I almost felt I thought my face was getting red I'm like does it I don't know does anybody know anything I'm not sure um, but I did go up to her afterwards and I said you know I just have to tell you in June we put 300 mergansers at that spot now it doesn't prove causation it's just a, it's just an interesting observation at that point right um, and so what it did for us though is it got us to start to think ecologically. 
Back in the day, copper sulfate, nobody was thinking ecologically. When we started merganser moving around, we weren't thinking ecologically. And now it's like we really need to start to look at what impact does removing a top predator from a lake have on the lake, and what impact does it have where you're going to put them? And so that started to, in our minds, in 2017, late, this is, all, this is October, but starting to think about that for 2018. All right, 2018. We kept Glen, Lyme, and Leelaw. We added Walloon, Lake Charlevoix, Elk Skigamog, and Long. So for Project 18, we wanted to continue to reduce costs, so what did we do? We trained, we put kits together, and we trained others to collect the water samples. So I'm not trapping ducks anymore, and I'm not collecting water samples. We can train people to do that. Therefore, we can get a lot more science done because we have this CBM happening. We used CBM to begin an enteric bacteria assessment. We wanted to get a handle on possibly uh, septic uh, fields that may, might not be working, and so we started a project in 2018 using qPCR as well. Then we surveyed all of those lakes that you just saw, uh, uh, major lakes, uh, for all parasites. You say, well, why would you do that? We know it's a merganser, and we know it's this snail, we know it's this duck. All you got to do is get in there and get them out of there, and, and everything is going to be fine. And we said, well, we want to look ecologically at some things here. So we want to we want to collect all snails, and we want to look at all snails. So we did. We identified during that time seven itch-causing schistosome species. And you saw the slide that Tom put up with all the lists. We had seven of them that we found on those lakes. We also developed and published this one. Uh, Patrick, uh, his lab, developed a species-specific assay. So not only can we take a known volume of water and count the worms, we can now tell how many of each species, what percent of each species those worms are. So that is a lot better, that technique now, we're using that moving forward. We wanted to improve site-specific swarmers itch prevention innovations, in other words, keep working on those things, the plan B, so to speak. Reduce the cost, improve the designs, validate the effectiveness. We also wanted to learn more about these cercari, because really what causes swimmers itch? Did the ducks cause swimmers itch? Did the snails cause swimmers itch? It's those cercari that are causing the swimmers itch. So the more we can learn about them, maybe we can come up with some ways to, to do that. Discovered uh, import, uh, the impacts of distance from shore, moving water, stirring up the bottom. You hear that, wow, stirring up the bottom. And so we wanted to find out you know, what impact those have. We also created what we consider as like a 911. This is our, our attempt at a 911 site for reporting swimmers itch across North America. So we contacted lake associations in Wisconsin and Minnesota and, and, and to the east. And we think that would Im will improve our chance of, maybe I should just accept this. <laughs> Uh, improve our chance of uh, securing state, actually I could turn my uh, Wi-Fi off, but anyway, improve chance of securing state and federal money, provided uh, reporting capabilities for all lakes. We are improving this, for those of you that are interested, for next year where anybody that reports a, a case to this site is going to be able to drop a pin, and then we're going to be able to supply your lake association with th the information uh, for that. Uh, reporting then. And so it's going to be more valuable than just, oh, it was from this lake, but we know where on the lake. And so that's coming and we're improving that and that will be ready to go for this summer. It also will increase our understanding of swimmer's itch on large geographic scale because now we can look at North American continent, what's going on. These are cards are on your table. You're free to take those. We have more. Um, and, and really you can take your phone and just take your camera and go right to that and bring you right to the site and you can report cases and so we're going to promote that as we go. But that was 2018 we started that. Now, we had some unexpected results in 2018. People at Glen Lake were complaining. Rob Kerner came to me and called me and said, Ron, we removed all the merganzers in 2017 and I got people getting swimmers itch. Lots of swimmers itch. Ron, would you come to the association meeting? Because I think I have a bullseye on my back. I promise people, that, I promise people that, you know what? Your problems are going away. And there's, there's an issue. And so we're like, 
Yeah, we were, we were all in on, in 2017, we were all in on merganser removal. We did a spring program. We were out in the cold looking for nests because if we can find the nest, we'll plug the nest and then they won't be able to go there and that'll decrease their you know, population, which we don't think that'll work anymore either. But this graph here, and maybe you can't see it from the back, just shows May, June, July, August, September. The blue is 2016 number of reported cases. 2017, now we started trapping here, 2018, 2019. And so, yep, uh, there's a little problem, okay? Maybe the papules aren't, there aren't as many. Nope, these are papules. They, they did a good job of recording all this, 2016, 17, 18, and 19. So not only were they getting more storm resistance, it was worse. Scientifically, we showed these are water samples. This is a little complex, but in, so that we could compare lakes, we went the ratio of samples that were more than 30 worms to less than 30. So this column here shows the ratio of more than 30 worms to less than 30 worms. So if we did 10 sites on your lake, what percent of them were more than 30, which we consider pretty bad? Uh, the, the, it's 25 liters. That's like a big five-gallon bucket of water. And if you have more than 30 worms in there, and, you're, and that's in your lake, and you're going to go swimming, it's, it's pretty bad, okay? So this is, 2000, I'm sorry, I, this is 2017 results, 0.79. Well, Glen Lake went down just a little bit, okay? So North Lake Leno, where we've been trapping mergansers for two years, 0.14 to 0.83. Lime Lake, where we've been trapping at this point for four years, 0.14 to 0.33, so it doubled. And so the, our water collections showed what the people were telling us in 2018, like, we are getting swimmers itch. What is going on? We also had unexpected results in that we, as Tom alluded to, we, because we looked at all snails, we looked at this snail. People said, well, that, that doesn't carry. You don't need to waste your time with the helisoma snail because it doesn't carry schistosomes. And we're gonna tell a story here in a real quick second when we bring my daughter up because she was a big part of this. Um, we're gonna tell a story about how we discovered this in 2018. And so to wrap this piece up, some major questions then after 2017, 2018, we, we believe that our data should drive what we do next. And so what should we do in 2019, this, this, next, this past year? And so we said, all right, we need to figure out how prevalent that new species is. We need to do some more looking at that new species. If we believe that it's really just the merganser and the one snail and the one parasite, and we're taking all the summer birds off, then maybe it's the spring and fall migratory birds. Oops. Maybe it's the spring and one second. Maybe it's the spring and fall migratory birds. So we need to look at that. Patrick's gonna explain that piece. Kelsey and I'll explain number one. And then also, this is ecologically again, we're thinking. Our schistosomes, this was supported by uh, tip of the mid or MICEP. Our schistosomes are carry present at the approved relocation sites. Because we were hearing of reports of swimmers itch in the bays. And we're like, okay, well, they aren't supposed to have snails, and so uh, we should look at that. So these are the things that we said. Oh, and then as far as the enteric bacteria, we wanted to continue what we did. So we said, do major rain events increase the human enteric bacteria input into the lake? So we're, we're doing swarm resich, but we're doing some enteric bacteria with the qPCR. Our field work for 2019, so let's jump to 2019. So we're going to go right into the next section here. Uh, these are all the lakes I inadvertently, I think the computer, they were too close. Lime and Little Traverse is right there. Uh, that's the other lake. But all those lakes we worked on in 2019. And yes, I do need to, it isn't just about me. Certainly most of it isn't about me. There's a lot of people doing a lot of work. Um, Kelsey Frelick and her husband, they're both teachers. Kelsey is a biology teacher in St. Joe. Uh, she runs our lab. Uh, Chris is a field guy. Uh, Patrick, and I'll introduce him in a minute, his student who is now Dr. Sidney Rudko, a PhD student. Last year we had full-time two Hope College uh, students, Matt Schuling and Dan Clyde. 
And then Annette is also here. You saw her when you checked in, uh, a retired science teacher. She worked with Kelsey in the lab. And then uh, someone who's still working now, Brooke uh, McPhail, who's at the university. She's a PhD student with Patrick. So that was our team in 2019. And so now let's talk about the three, the three things where we talk about the new species, and then I'll bring Patrick up to talk about the other one. So evidence of a novel species of avian schistosome infecting Helosoma snails. And I do need to make a point here. So what we presented to the lakes that said we'd like to do this in 2018 was what we called the comprehensive lake assessment research. And I put the question marks because there were people that questioned why we were doing the extra work. Why we were, why would you spend money to do that? You just need to get a, find out that there's mergansers and then you get your permit and then you trap them and so on and so forth. But we went with this extra step, um, and you'll see what happened there. So this is, again, the generalized life cycle. This is what we found in 2018. This is a generalized life cycle. <laughs> simplified, simplified, yes, simplified. This is what we actually found on those lakes in 2018. These were carriers, and we did that by checking their fecal material. These were the snails that we found infected, and these were the parasites that we identified in northwest Michigan. That one right there is what we're going to talk about here for the next couple minutes. The Helosoma snail, which nobody, I guess stopped, we stopped looking at them because I was always taught through my whole, all of my years that uh, they don't carry. We don't have to collect those because they don't carry the, the schistosome. So Kelsey's going to come up, and she's going to, tell this piece of it better than I can because she was there, so go <laughs> That's ahead. That's right, he was too, but his memory sometimes is a little, <laughs> say that because it's my dad. Um, so what we were collecting all snails found on these lakes that we were working on. Um, and so we would collect them, and uh, Tom mentioned this before, but we would throw the hoops, um, and then with snorkel gear, we would um, just collect all of them in these little nets. So those would come back to lab for us, um, and we would put them in these little well plates. And the, the well plates hold one snail each, okay? And you put them in in the afternoon, overnight, um, we just let them set. And then in the morning, they shed, it's called. They give off their cercari. Um, and it's known that it's due to light, that at first light, they'll start giving them off. And so um, we, we put the lights on, we turn the lights on, let them set for an hour or two, and then we look at every single individual snail. Um, and what we're looking for is those little circarians, specifically the ones that cause Somer's itch. And so I was looking, um, I was in lab by myself one day, looking at a thousand snails, I'm sure, or it felt like, and I saw this circari that I'd never seen before. And it was acting just like a schistosome, just like a Somer's itch causing snail. Um, and so I look at it and I like, Look at it again, and you know, I'm like starting to question, but then, so I call dad, right? And he's Lake Charlevoix, I think. Mm -hmm. You're on a Lake Charlevoix. I was like, dad, I think there's a schistosome coming out of a Helosoma snail. And his response was, are you sure it's a Helosoma snail? <laughs> dad, I know my snails. <laughs> like, yes, this is a Helosoma snail. And so, he, you know, he said, put it to the side. I'll look at it when we get home. Let's, okay, and I, and I actually found a couple that day. I think, I think there were two infected. Mm -hmm. And we looked at them later, um, and, you know, he's, and he said. And let me say, I came back, and all right, let me see it. And I look at it, and I look down at it. And I look down <laughs> at it, and it, it's a helosoma snail. And I'm thinking, yeah. well, maybe the snails jump dishes or something. Um, yeah, right. And right. everything I was taught by Harvey over, you know, 40 years, that's a schistosome. It looks like a schistosome, yeah. acts like a schistosome. And yeah, and so, so we called Patrick that same day. We were driving to Glen Lake Schools, actually, for a meeting. Mm -hmm. We called Patrick, and we were like, hey, helosoma snail. <laughs> it's, we think it has a schistosome. Um, and, the, and the thought was that it was a spiroarchid, mm -hmm. um, which is a cousin to schistosomes, goes through turtles, does not cause swimmer's itch. And so it was sort of like a letdown that night. Like, oh, shoot, we thought we found this really cool thing, and now we probably didn't, but mm -hmm. okay, it was cool. Um, but we kept it, and we sent it to, to Patrick anyways, um, and they sequenced the DNA. Uh, and, and through that, discovered it was not a spiroarchid. It was, in fact, a schistosome, mm -hmm. um, which was a really, really cool thing. 
that yeah. we found. Yeah. So in 2019, let's let's learn more about this as much as we can about this parasite. And so in 2018, if you take a look, these are we looked at other lakes as well, but these are lakes that we did snails both years, so we can compare. South Lake Lila, North Lake Lila, Glen, and Walloon. And we found just uh, seven in those lakes in 2018 and 122 in 2019. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yes. For our purposes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. And we Sorry. Looked, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we, we use the words. And, yeah. yeah, we looked at a lot more snails in 2019, the Helosoma snails particularly, like any time we saw them, we were collecting them because we're looking for this. But if you look yeah. at the percent, yeah. they were also greatly increased in 2019. Right, so that, that's the percent difference between 18 and 19. And so you're looking at, and that's a question mark, it went up that much, went down a little bit on Glenn, but it went up on the other ones. And so we're like, wow, okay, the percentage mm -hmm. more. Very right. interesting. Um, and so then the question really is, does it cause swimmer's itch? Because it can have this gene coding, it, it codes as schistosome, but does it cause it? And so, um, of course, we start putting it on our arms and uh, the, our, students, our students' arms, um, who, let's just say this, they were voluntary. I asked them every single time. <laughs> Is this okay with you? They signed a waiver. No, yeah, they exactly. didn't sign a waiver. Um, so they were our volunteers. And actually, so Dan was the first one that it did cause swimmer's itch on his arm um, in this past summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out that next step. What is, we're, we're still putting the pieces together with all of that. So what we don't know is what bird does it go through? Yeah, so, so we started, and Rob mentioned this, that when we didn't know back in the day, a long time ago, what caused, what bird was the host, Ron just looked at a whole bunch of poop samples. And I was like, oh, that's what we did this past summer. There you go. Um, because we just took poop samples from like every bird we could get. Um, we tried to attract the common grackle, so that's my daughter, like putting some corn out for grackles, <laughs> thinking maybe, man, I mean, they're around the water. They carry it. They're yeah, carrier. could we, we looked at kingfisher poop. We looked at even some mammals, um, some water mammals, and didn't really find, we didn't know. We just collected what we saw and sent it to Patrick again and yeah. said, here, yeah. here's what we have found, um, you know, barcode and see what you find. And these are the mere city of them. That, that's the other stage that is in the water that goes through the, that is exactly. in, the yeah, in, the, in the poop. So yeah, so then December, this past yeah. December, this yep. is... and so then I'll take this up because I happen to be there. Then uh, a text from Patrick on December 18, that's not that long ago, in the morning, I get a text from Patrick and it says, holy cow, <laughs> it's a Canada goose. And they actually did the barcode, they got the barcode and started to look at it and actually 100% match to the Myricidia. So the Cercari out of the snail, barcode that, barcode the Myricidia out of the duck, and they 100% match. And so in one goose, which raises a whole bunch of questions, uh, question, question, questions. When does most transition, transmission to snails take place? Why didn't we see infections in other geese we examined? Is this an anomaly? Um, where are the adult worms found in the goose? Because some adult worms are not found in the intestine, they're found in the nasal cavity. Uh, how does transmission take place? And so on and so forth. I guess at this point, we can say that we, we told you what we found. We don't, we don't know, as Tom said, a whole lot more work needs to be done because of what he showed and now what Patrick's gonna show you about this parasite as well as the other ones, uh, as how prevalent it is. Uh, we need to learn more about this species. And, and we even wonder, is it increasing? You know, because we saw it in just two years. And so that's where we're at. Now, I do wanna do something here, and I know this takes two minutes or a minute and a half, but because if we had not done the research, if these lake associations had not said, yeah, okay, we believe in what you're doing, we'll pay extra money because we believe in what you're doing we would sit here today and we would not know about this new parasite. This happened in 2018 and 2019. And that's a, that's a lesson for, is there a reason to do research? There is, just 
research, just find out what's out there. And, and then hopefully it'll be applied to, to that. But uh, here's what I'd like to do. Oh, you just I'm gonna agree do. for you. Okay, that's okay. good. Hopefully Thanks. that'll be done. Would you, if you, I'm, please do this for me. If you're from Glen Lake, if you're from that association, would you just stand up and stay standing? Please, and anybody from Glen Lake, just stand up please. Walloon Lake, if you would stand up. No, no, hold on, hold on. Walloon Lake, stand up, okay. Uh, La Lime Lake, thank you. Uh, Lake Charlevoix, thank you. Long Lake, Lake Leelanau, Elk Skigama, Platt, Big Platt. Uh, I don't know if it's prick, Pick Girl Crooked. Anybody from Pick Girl Crooked? Intermediate, oh, okay, okay. intermediate. Three lakes, it's uh, Torch, Bel Air, and nobody from Wisconsin, White Sand Lake. But I, I, I really would like to give these folks, because they represent their associations, a round of applause for, for, for doing it. So thank you. Thank you. All right, now I'm gonna introduce. Can I just say one thing? You can since I'm part of this presentation. <laughs> you yeah. only gave me 10 minutes, but I want to take 30 seconds to sort of get our heads around the idea of finding a new species in science. That's really hard to do. You know, in the Amazon, you find new species a lot because the biodiversity there is so great. But for here, we kind of know in North America what our biology is and what our species are. So to find a new species certainly deserves a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Patrick Hannington, and he is not only a collaborator, but he's become a very good friend. Uh, I met him uh, on another serendipitous uh, event when I went up to the University of Alberta in Edmonton to bring my son home, who got his PhD there, and he said, Dad, there's a guy here that does some swimmers itch. I don't know who he is, but my buddy knows him. Do you want to meet him when you're here? I'm like, yeah, of course I want to meet him. I go up there, I meet Patrick on a morning in his lab, and within an hour, I invited him to Michigan because of what he was doing. He is one of Canada's best scientists, and he certainly is the best one on anything with swimmers itch in Canada. And I saw what he was doing in his lab, and I knew it, that we had to get him here if we could. And he immediately said, yeah. I'd like to do that next summer and bring some grad students. So he brought a couple of his PhD students in 2016, and we have uh, been collaborating ever since. And um, so Dr. Patrick Hannington. OK, <laughs> okay. thanks, thanks, Ron. Um, can you guys hear me OK uh, with the microphone? OK. Um, that's going to be a tough act to follow, um, the new species description and everything. So. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for everyone uh, to, to come to this. It's, it's great to see such a huge group of people who are really interested in this and passionate about your lakes. And um, as Ron suggested, it's been a little while now. I've come to Michigan quite a few times. I was just joking with Rob that I'll probably just need to buy a cabin up here soon <laughs> and just move. Um, so as was suggested, I'm going to um, focus on some of the work that we did in 2019. And I'll apologize at the start because I'm going to be a lot more data heavy uh, than the last talk. Um, and I'm going to try to walk you through this big study that we did um, to try to address three main questions. Uh, that's my goal here. And so um, one of the questions I'd like to answer for you is um, the contribution of migratory mergansers to swimmer's itch. This is a question that came up because of some of the observations that we had made in 2018 where, as Ron had shown, um, lakes like Glen Lake where there were persistent merganser relocation efforts going on were still getting hit by swimmer's itch pretty hard. And so we were wondering to ourselves, well, why, why are we seeing these parasites still on the lake? Um, and a lot of that work bur kind of grew out of the species-specific um, assays that we had designed, which allowed us to get down to that very specific resolution about what was going on with different species of parasites. And that, that uh, I'll show you uh, in the first couple slides here. Um, I also want to tackle this question of why, whether or not this new species that Ron and Kelsey just described is, a, is important to swimmer's itch, um, and where is it important to swimmer's itch. And, um, and Tom kind of uh, touched on this in his talk, which really nicely kind of overlaid geographically uh, where the snail hosts and these parasites are. And I'm not going to show you a bunch of maps. I'm going to show you some much more complicated heat maps, which are maps of some sorts. But, um, but I'm going to try to uh, talk to you a little bit about this topic as well. 
And then uh, more generally, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can learn about swimmer's itch in Michigan still. Um, and part of this is going to touch on relocation sites uh, and the merganza relocation efforts. And uh, I'll talk more generally about things like snail density. So as Ron suggested, um, a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last three years has been predicated on this foundation of community-based monitoring. And I want to take a moment, because I'm going to touch on this a few times in my talk, and then I have a whole talk in the, after this that's focused just on community-based monitoring and enteric bacteria. Um, but I want to emphasize that um, a lot of the work that I'm presenting here was heavily reliant on not only the team at Freshwater Solutions, but also uh, a bunch of community partners that really were instrumental in helping us do this work. And that um, includes you know, running qPCR samples um, in Ron's garage, collecting water samples, um, out on boats, um, getting students involved in the program, uh, Ron getting in a wetsuit and collecting snails, um, and other people just standing off in nice water collecting water samples and snails and stuff like that. Um, so I want to make sure that that is, uh, is stated at the beginning, that what I'm going to show you could not have been done without community partnerships. I also want to just touch on this slide that Ron already showed you, which is um, what we kind of started with uh, when we started our 2019 project. We in 2018, uh, had gotten a bunch of data that suggested that things were a lot more complicated here than the simple sort of uh, Stegnicola marginata snail, um, common merganser, and Trichobohartzia stegnicolae. And so um, through this DNA barcoding that they, they mentioned in their previous talk, um, we went about uh, piecing together uh, all the different parasites that we were able to find in snails coming out of uh, uh, um, snails here in Michigan, parasites coming out of snails in Michigan. And uh, something else that happened was that uh, as part of this big snail survey that Ron mentioned, we were able to show that these snails that are highlighted in red, um, these snails were present at pretty much all the lakes that we had been working on in the past. And so you can see here whether or not the snails in these different groups are present at Glen Lake, for example, or South Lake Leelanau, North Lake Leelanau, Lime Long, Skigamog, et cetera. My point in showing you this slide um, in a table format is really just to emphasize that there's a lot of lakes, Walloon Lake, for example, or, or you know, the one in Wisconsin. They have pretty much every snail that we would need to cycle any of those parasites I just showed you. So um, my point in showing you this is that it's, it's going to be a complicated story I'm going to tell you, so I'm going to warn you right at the beginning. Because it's also the fact that almost all of those lakes also have all the birds that you would need to complete those life cycles. And so um, here are the lakes shown here. Uh, and then you can see the, the size of these lakes, which, you know, there's some that are pretty big. I still have to wrap my head around miles to kilometers because I'm coming from Canada. So um, it's bigger than 60 kilometers. And, um, and you can see these uh, three birds that I've highlighted here are ones that you're going to hear a lot about because, as you uh, all know, you know, the merganser is, is a troubling bird from the perspective of T. steg nicolae. And then the Canada goose is going to be troubling for this new parasite and mallards, which also transmit an important parasite species. So a lot of the work that we did in 2018 was uh, focused on de designing these uh, qPCR tests, which allowed us to uh, identify specific parasite species from a water sample. And so this was building off of what we kind of, we call the pan-avian qPCR assay, which is the one that a lot of people had been using uh, up into the end of 2018, which just detected all the different stormage causing parasites from a water sample. And this is the one that, that Ron was saying, it allowed us to kind of take a water sample and count the number of worms that were in it. But to get down to the species level resolution, what we did is we took parasites that we knew came from all these different snails. So we took a single snail, we got all the parasites out of it, uh, and then we did DNA barcoding, we identified the parasite, and then we used that DNA as a template for um, validating our qPCR tests um, for these different species. And so obviously, if these tests were going to be functional in the way we needed them to be, um, you know, the test for Trichobohartzia stagnicolae should detect Trichobohartzia stagnicolae, but it shouldn't detect Trichobohartzia brante, Ocelleta, T. Ficelli, or this new Helosoma species, right? If we want to be able to get that level of resolution down to a species level, we clearly can't have cross-reactivity between all these different species that are causing swimmer's itch. And so the point in showing you this slide was just to show you that we did this pretty comprehensive validation that also included a whole bunch of other species of, of Digenetic trematode, which are sort of this broader group of parasites that come out of snails that, that Tom actually showed you a whole bunch of images of the ampistomes and the echinostomes and stuff like that. So these cercaria are also in the water. And so we need to make sure that these tests don't cross-react with those parasites either. And with the exception of, of T. ocelleta, which also could detect 
T. zidati, and there's a lot of movement in the, in the field to just merge those into the same species right now anyways. Um, we got it to a point where we could use these tests to detect the exact species of parasite we wanted. So I'm gonna take a little segue here and I'm gonna show you the data that we got from an analysis in 2018. And I wanna, the story I wanna tell you with this isn't about the parasites, but it's about the advantages of using qPCR for water monitoring. Because using qPCR for water monitoring has, a, I think it has a lot of advantages. I'm gonna talk to you about that a lot. But one of them is that that water sample that we took in 2018 from each of those, these lakes that are shown here on the, on the x-axis, all those water samples we analyzed using that pan-avian qPCR assay. But we were able, after we designed all the species-specific assays, we were able to go back and take those water samples that we had extracted DNA from, we took that DNA, and we ran the, these different species-specific assays on it. So we essentially went back in time to do this study, right? We, we took water samples that were collected in the summer, we ran these species-specific tests in the winter on water samples that we had already analyzed for the pan-avian qPCR. So that's a huge advantage is this ability to archive the DNA that allows us to then retroactively go back to those samples and ask new questions. And what we found is that T. steg nicolae makes up the dominant bulk of the parasite population in all these lakes at this single time point that we collected these water samples. And one could argue that, oh, well, this means that the relocation effort is targeting the right parasite. But I would also argue that at this point, Glen Lake had already been relocating birds for two years. And so the fact that this parasite, T. segnicolae, is, makes up 99% of the parasite population at this time point, and the size of these bubbles is just the actual intensity of that DNA signal, that means that this is the dominant parasite at that lake. That, to me, suggests that the relocation effort is not working, okay? And um, you can see that the story is pretty much the same for almost every lake. This T. segnicolae at this time point was a very dominant parasite in almost every lake that we looked at. So to us, that, that is another reason that we started asking the question, well, is this relocation effort even really doing something that is going to end with Swimmer's Edge being removed from these lakes? So that brings me to the 2019 study. And I want to summarize this from the perspective of the complexity of the study and the incorporation of the community partnerships that were needed to, to get it off the ground. And so this study um, incorporated 18, or, sorry, 16 lakes. Um, and there was at least 10 sites that were on each of these 16 lakes that were sampled. And then there were um, three lakes that were part of the study, which are the ones I'm going to focus on most for this talk, where those 10 sites were sampled every week. Um, and then the, the samples were, um, we designed the study and we, we uh, analyzed samples. There was two of us at the University of Alberta, myself, and then uh, my former PhD student, Sidney Rudko. Um, and then we had these six freshwater solutions program managers. And there was over 25 community partners that were collecting water samples. And this ultimately ended up with about 500 water samples being collected as part of our 2019 survey. We ran a, over 1,000 um, of the pan-avian qPCR tests, and that was all done by Freshwater Solutions in their lab. And then we took the positive uh, pan-avian test, and we ran them in my lab at the University of Alberta. And that meant that Sydney ran five, over 5,000 species-specific qPCR tests. And so um, I want to focus in on these three um, lakes that sampled sites each week because this is really where we're getting some information that we've never gotten to this kind of level or scale before with this type of, of study. So I want to explain to you those three lakes a little bit because there was a sort of a method behind us incorporating them in this kind of scale. So the first is South Lake Leelanau that I want to introduce you to, and North Lake Leelanau was part of this as well. So I think they're, you know, Lake Leelanau, we'll say is part of it. Um, and, but South Lake Leonon in particular has no summer resident mergansers, and they d didn't have a merganser relocation control program because obviously they have no birds um, that are needed to be relocated. And then we have Walloon Lake, and Walloon Lake has merganser broods. Um, re they have resident birds, and they um, have not had a control program. So they're kind of our control lake in this study, right? When we look at what this parasite population looks like at Walloon Lake, this is what we see without any in interference. And then we have Glen Lake, and Glen Lake has broods, but they've been re relocating those broods for three years. So um, they've had this ongoing control program. And just to give you a sense of, of what this study looked like, these are the sample sites that were at Glen Lake, um, these 10 red dots. So they were chosen to kind of go around the lake. Um, there was a, a method to, to selecting a lot of them, but um, 
those were the samples that were, those sites were sampled between May and the end of October. The samples were collected every Tuesday morning between 8 and 10 in the morning. Um, we took a whole bunch of metadata as well. There's things like wind direction and wind speed, temperature of the water, all this kind of stuff was collected at the same time. Um, and then each of those samples, like I said, were analyzed using this pan-avian qPCR test. And then the positive samples underwent uh, the analysis for the specific species of parasites that cause squirmers itch, okay? So the first question I want to tackle within this study is do migratory megalanges contribute to swimmer's itch? For the next little chunk of my talk, it's maybe a medium-sized chunk of my talk actually, um, I'm going to be showing you things that look like this. And, so, and they're going to get a little bit smaller than this one. So I'll apologize for the complexity of what you're going to see, but what I really want you to look at isn't the, the, any of these specific boxes. It's the, the kind of 30,000 foot view of what this is showing you. So I'm going to orient you a little bit where on the y-axis here, that I, where I'm indicating, these are the different sites at each of these different lakes. And then at the, on the x-axis of these heat maps, these are the different time points. Um, so basically, the, divided by week all, going along, okay? And then we have this scale on the right-hand side. This is um, an indication of the color intensity. And I'm, I've, I've switched it up so that the, the maps that are for T. stag nicolae are going to be blue. The maps for the new helisoma, uh, the parasite that's coming out of the helisoma snails are going to be red, and the maps for the T. physeli are going to be green. So the color just indicates the species of parasite we're looking at, but the darker the color gets, the more of the parasite is there. Okay, that's kind of the, the way you should look at it. So for example, here, this little middle square right here, there's a lot of parasite there at that site at that time. So site H9 on August 6th has a lot of this T. stag nicolae parasite there at that site. Okay, um, and so when I zoom out a little bit on these heat maps, that's kind of just the picture I want you to think about is, is what's happening, where are the white spots, where are the really dark blue spots, okay? The white spots, the clear spots, those are places where we have no positives, okay? So those are free and clear. If you went swimming at this lake on May 26th, you didn't have a, really a chance of encountering a T. stag nicolae parasite, okay? I don't know what that would have been like, but it may be cold. 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 So my first, the first thing I want to show you is this. These are, these are two different lakes that we studied in this study. And I have a question for you, which is which of those two lakes it had the three-year Merganza relocation program? Because this is T. stag nicolae at two lakes, and one of them had a three-year relocation program. Do you think the top one had the relocation program? Oh, that was a good, good choice. Good choice. So that is the, the lake that had the relocation program. That's Glen Lake. And that's the T. stag nicolae population at Glen Lake at 10 different sites basically for the entire summer of 2019. So um, there's a, a, a number of things that we can take away from this, and I'm, I want to keep it pretty general because you can go really into the weeds on these graphs, and I'm sure that that'll happen at some point. Um, but I really want to just highlight some of the big picture stories here because uh, um, I could spend way too much time talking about details. So despite this three-year relocation program at Glen Lake, um, the T. stag nicolae remains the dominant species of swimmers just causing parasite on the lake. And I'll show you some comparisons in the future slides comparing Glen Lake's T. stag nicolae population to the other two species that we analyzed. Um, but this is, this is still a lot of T. stag nicolae, right? If I go back to this other slide where I asked you the question, this is Walloon Lake. So they don't have a control program, okay? And there are some differences, right, which I'll touch on here. Um, there are some differences between these two lakes, but Glen Lake still has a lot of T. stag nicolae, okay? So um, when we compare between Glen Lake and Walloon Lake, this being the control program lake and no control program, the thing that stands out to us most is just that Walloon Lake seems to have an emergence of those parasites slightly earlier in the season than does Glen Lake. And um, other than that, in terms of the abundance of the parasite, in terms of you know, when does it end and stuff like that, it's, it's, pretty, um, it's pretty cloudy. So other than this earlier beginning in the season, we don't see much difference. So this comparison between Glen Lake, which is a relocation lake, and the Walloon Lake, which is no relocation, it would suggest that, uh, if anything, the relocation effort has just kind of shifted when that parasite population is appearing at Glen Lake, okay? And that's something that kind of holds consistent because we, we kind of have a mini study that is a comparison to that with North and South Lake Leelanau because South Lake Leelanau doesn't have the resident broods and North Lake Leelanau has removed the broods. 
And so we would expect to see a, sort of a shift um, in the right, um, so a later start to the year for T. signiculae if that was true at both lakes, really, because then the contributing birds at those lakes, in theory, is going to be just the migratory birds. Um, so you can see a good comparison is that this parasite population here, um, it's appearing early, but for the T. stegnicolae populations, they seem to be right-shifted as well. That's kind of a, a pretty preliminary hypothesis, though, because um, we still don't really know what's going on in that sort of bigger question. But we do know, you know, okay, later shift, if you have no mergansers, that's maybe the, the main thing. This all suggests to us that the migratory birds are probably playing a role in contributing the T. stegnicolae population to these lakes. Now, we also have all these other lakes that are part of the study, and I don't want to forget about those lakes because that was also a really critical part. These lakes, I'm going to show you again, this, you've got to take a big view of this because these are all a, a bunch of other lakes that we worked on, Elkins, Kigamog, Torch, Intermediate, Platte, Bel Air, Long, Crooked Pickerel. This is their T. stag necklace profile, and I've tried to just kind of divide them with these black lines. So the point here is um, you can see lots of these lakes have T. stag necklace positive sites at them. Okay? Uh, these are all... Um, these are all, you know, out of those 10 sites, but they were only sampled once. They weren't sampled weekly like the other ones were. But there's two interesting stories, and there's, I mean, there's lots of interesting stories, but there's something interesting that I want to bring up here, and that's this comparison between Long Lake and Elkins Kigmog. Elkins Kigmog had a single brood in 2018, and Long Lake had no brood in 2018. And remember that a lot of the parasite populations that we're measuring are skewed by a year, right? So what happened in 2018 is really going to be what dictates what we find in 2019. And then what happened in 2019 is going to dictate what we're finding, going to find this year, right? Until we get to the end of the year. And then what we see, you know, at the end of the season in the fall, that might have been what happened in the spring, okay? So these two lakes are quite different, considering that they um, have a reasonably small contribution of mergansers uh, at the lake. So elk and skigmog clearly have a lot of T. stegnic lake long lake. We didn't find any. Um, but what's interesting is, and this kind of gets to what Tom had been talking about with snail densities uh, and populations, at Elkins Kigmog, SMR Genata makes up 52% of the total snail population, and that's a, out of a sample size of 1,427 snails. At Long Lake, the SMR Genata makes up only 4.5% of the snail population. And so these two lakes, while they're certainly different in many ways, when we start being able to measure the parasite populations, we have to consider that there are other things that are playing in here, and the snail population is an important contributor. In a lake where you have 50% of your snails, SMR Genata, you have a very high capacity for transmission of T. stegnicolae. In a lake where you have a very small population of S. marginata, you have a lower percentage chance, a lower likelihood of T. stegnicolae transmission. Okay? So it's not all simple. I told you that at the beginning. Um, and, and so we also have to remember that this is a life cycle. This is a parasite life cycle. And so you have to have the hosts to have the parasite there. So to have T. stegnicolae at, at Elk Lake, you need to have some contribution of the of the parasite from the snail and from the bird host, okay? So I want to address this question directly. Do migratory mergansers contribute to swimmer's itch? Um, the evidence from South Lake Leelanau and Glen Lake is the answer is yes. Um, Glen Lake has relocated mergansers, resident mergansers, for three years. So to have T. stegnicolae there, the mergansers, which are the only known bird host for T. stegnicolae that we know of, um, those birds have to be contributing parasites to that lake to have a resident population of T. stegnicolae. Okay? Merganser relocation doesn't seem to influence the T. stegnicolae population significantly, um, and it doesn't eliminate the T. stegnicolae population from the lake, certainly. Okay? And we also need to be cognizant of the fact that these snails, the SMR genata snails, need to be there, and that is important to remember because if you don't have a strong SMR genata population, you might have mergansers, but you might not have a significant capacity for transmission of T. stegnicolae. Okay? So the next question I wanted to address here is, is Trichobulhartsia novel species, this one that comes out of the helisoma snails, is this an important uh, parasite for swimmer's itch? You've already heard that it can cause swimmer's itch. So the answer is that, well, it can cause swimmer's itch, so it might be important. I would argue that this is um, what that parasite looks like at Walloon Lake. And so I would say it's very important at Walloon Lake. Um, this, this parasite is actually, if you look at Walloon Lake, um, you look at their T. stegnicolae population, this novel species population, and then T. Ficelli, which is going through physid snails and mallards. This new species is probably the most important species of swimmer's dish-causing parasite at Walloon Lake. 
So um, you know, this is probably, it can come as a bit of a shock to somebody who has thought about this for a while as being a linear relationship between a merganser, a uh, Stegnicola amarginata snail, and a T. stegniclae parasite, because we've thrown now a new species that we didn't even know about in early 2018 um, into a mix, and basically now this could be the main driver of swim resistance some of your lakes. So this is gonna be a really important thing to consider moving forward, um, especially in the context of control, because you suddenly can't just think of this as, I'm gonna move birds from here to here, and that's gonna impact my parasites, because A, we know that it, on Glen Lake, it hasn't really impacted the T. stegniclae population in a way that would prevent swimmer's itch. But B, you could just have this parasite there too, right? So if Walloon Lake got rid of all the T. stegniclae off of their lake, you would still have this parasite and this parasite causing swimmer's itch, okay? And we can tell more stories using these other single, single sample site lakes, where um, on this one, I wanna focus on Bel Air and Crooked Pickerel. And again, it comes down to snail densities, but it's an interesting story here which complicates what I told you in the previous few slides. Told you it was gonna be complicated. So Helostoma snails make up 20.8% of the snail population at Bel Air Lake, but none of them were infected with this new parasite. And as you can see, Bel Air Lake really doesn't have that parasite, the new Helostoma uh, uh, releasing parasite in its water. Crooked pickerel, though, has a much smaller proportion of its snail population made up of Helostoma snails. They have a 1% infection prevalence in those Helostoma snails, but they have that parasite in their water. And so having the snails be at your lake is an important predictor of whether or not the parasite can be there or not. You have to have a compatible snail at your lake to have the parasite. But if the, if the snails aren't infected by that parasite, then it still doesn't make a difference. You're not gonna have the parasite in the water if the snails aren't getting infected, right? So even with a 1% infection prevalence, and like, was, like Rob uh, suggested, you know, even with a 2% infection prevalence, you can have swimmer's itch in the water, no problem. In Alberta, where I am, we find it's like a 0.1% infection prevalence in our snail populations for swimmers itch causing parasites. And people get swimmers itch there all the time. And so you don't need a lot of your snails to be infected to contribute parasites into the water, right? You can have, as Ron suggested, thousands of parasites coming out of a single snail. So zero infection, though, zero infection prevalence means no parasites, right? You're not gonna have any of the parasite there if you don't have any snails shedding the parasite, okay? So remember, snail numbers uh, are important, but infected snail numbers are more critical when we think about uh, whether or not we're gonna have the parasite at a lake or not, okay? So snail density doesn't tell the entire story, although it is a, an important part of it. So how important is this new species of Trichobilhartsia uh, to swimmer's itch? Well, in some lakes that we surveyed, it's the dominant parasite. Um, and so it potentially is playing a very important role in swimmer's itch uh, in northern Michigan. Uh, the Canada geese, which as Ron and Kelsey suggested, uh, we think are, is, is maybe the main definitive host for this parasite, um, is gonna, and Helosoma snails are gonna need to be considered as parts of the swimmer's itch conversation now. And they, if we're gonna talk about control efforts, they need to be part of that conversation. Uh, and as a sort of another little aside thing, snail infection rate is also a, re a really important biological aspect that under, underpins the parasite abundance at a lake. So you have to keep that in mind, okay? So what can we learn about swimmer's itch from this big three lake study and, and the other sites? So one is if you take these bigger picture looks at our heat maps that I'm showing you, you'll notice that there's a lot of white squares, okay? And so that means that not every site is positive for swimmer's itch. Right? If we don't find any of these species at these sites, and the panavian assay is negative, then that means that that site doesn't have swimmer's itch at it at that time, okay? And so if you, you, you probably, you know, you, you're gonna look at this and you won't be able to pull this out without a little bit of a highlight, so I'm gonna highlight one spot here for you. This spot, um, which is site G8 at Glen Lake, which probably means something to Rob, but um, everyone else, I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. Um, site G8, is an example of a site that almost routinely has no swimmer's itch causing parasites at it, okay? So that is a really interesting observation, and, and I think one of the things that we wanna look at moving forward is does site G8 always have no parasites at it, or is this just an anomaly for 2019, okay? Um, and I think the bigger picture of why I'm telling you this story is because this has implications for how you might decide to swim at Glen Lake, right? You might not wanna swim at site H9, which is this one, Right? But you might want to swim at G8, 
Now, there might be things about G8 that might make it not a good swimming spot. But why G8 has no parasites added is an important thing for us to understand. The other thing that you can look at is, now this is at Walloon Lake, you can see that there are also times of the year, which are shown by these, um, these vertical lines and sites that are at Walloon Lake, where uh, we don't find parasites when we collect. And so what about those times of the year? Because that's sandwiched in between a whole bunch of parasites. So what's going on on that day? That um, hap what, what happened? Is there a storm that day or something like that? Is the water really choppy, a really strong wind? Um, you know, those kinds, of, uh, those kinds of drivers of why we might not be seeing parasites there are important things for us to understand. Site G8 at Glen Lake, um, as far as I can tell, is a boat launch. <laughs> so why you might not want to swim there. Um, but that site, if we look at, at, the, at the snail profile that was collected at that site, we only found four SMR genetic snails total at that site. No Helosoma snails, no Physis snails. Okay? Now we know that snail population presence at a site isn't necessarily the best predictor of swimmer's itch risk because you can have things like wind and stuff like that, like Tom showed, that will contribute cercaria from other places on your lake. But the conditions at site G8 seem to be pretty good for not having that be a big contributor either, right? But that's contrasted because site I-15 on Walloon Lake, so if you're at Walloon Lake, you know I-15. This is, this is where that is. I'm told it has a lot of offshore winds, um, so that might be why we don't see a lot of parasites there because it has the second highest snail density on the entire lake that we collected at. And so that site, though, is also a site absent of swimmers dish causing parasites, okay? So again, my point is that it's complicated because you can't use what's at the site as the main predictor um, of swimmers dish risk, but those are important things for us to try to figure out. Why is site I-15 no low risk and why is site G-8 low risk? Because they're not similar in terms of their snail compositions. Now I told you you can't use the snail density um, at a site uh, to be a good predictor. Um, and so that's what I'm showing you here, this tiny little heat map here is just showing you the SMR genata snail population. And so you can see that, um, that at that site, this site highlighted in red, that's where we have our highest SMR genata snail density on Glen Lake out of the sites we collected at. And it's not a particularly bad site to sample or to swim at. It, from an SMR genata uh, and T. steg nicolae perspective, it's, um, it's not the worst site on the lake. And so again, I'm just highlighting the fact that you have to be careful about using snail density um, at a specific site as a predictor of the risk of swimmers at that site because it doesn't necessarily hold true. And we, we've published and Tom has published the importance of wind in contributing to movement of the cercaria that might, you know, take cercaria that are being produced at this site, uh, M10, sorry, M13, and, uh, and moving it to some other site, okay? That being true, though, um, we know that at Glen Lake, we've had really uh, essentially an I uh, increase in swimmers dish reports since um, the relocation effort has started. And this is the graph that Ron showed you. Um, and so on a lake-wide level, I think it's still relevant to think about the snail populations and what's going on there because they are really predicating the presence of the cercaria in the lake. And so if you look at Glen Lake between 2018 and 2019, their snail population in terms of density has over doubled. Just total snail density has doubled at Glen Lake between 2018 and 2019. Um, and this is using a pretty, pretty restrictive method that Freshwater Solutions uses where they have this hoop that they throw. It's a randomized sampling um, that they do with this one meter square hoop collecting system. Um, so it's done to be scientifically rigorous. We see a huge increase in the snail density. The SMR genetic snail population has reduced by a little bit as a proportion of the whole snail population, but that actually means it's increased a lot because it's 20% of basically 14 snails per square meter rather than 29% of 6.7 snails per square meter. So at a lake-wide level, we know that the contributors to T. steg nicolae at Glen Lake have been increasing, especially at least between 2018 and 2019. So the question will be, how, what do we see next year, right? Because next year, you might be starting with a, a higher snail density at Glen Lake, and that could lead to even a worse swimmer's itch problem. Or you might see a crash, and then it might go down, okay? So these are more studies that we think will be valuable things to start looking at Lake how does the lake biology and the ecology of the snail start impacting the parasite species composition at the lake? And the story at Walloon Lake compared to Glen Lake is really interesting. So when we look at that new Helosoma um, parasite, the parasite that comes out of the Helosoma snails, Glen Lake has a pretty small population of that parasite. 
And Walloon Lake, as I showed you, has a really big population of that parasite. Walloon Lake, their snail um, population is 38.5% um, Helosoma in 2018. Remember that that's kind of the population that's going to contribute to these early um, parasite populations. And then Glen Lake is only 5% Helosoma in 2018. In 2019, while Loon Lake's population of Helosoma, a proportion of the total snail population has gone down. But in Glen Lake, it's going up. So this allows us to design a study, essentially, for 2020. We can say, well, does Walloon snail population continue to go on a downward trajectory? And do we see a decline in this new parasite prevalence? And does Glen Lake start seeing an increase in the prevalence of this parasite if its snail helosomal population continues to increase? So now we have, we have a really nice study where if we do one more year of this, we might start seeing that the snail population is really predicating the presence or absence of these parasite populations just staggered by one year. So what can we learn about swimmer's itch from this study? Um, we know that snail density doesn't necessarily predict the abundance of swimmer's itch causing parasites at a site, but that at a lake-wide level, those population changes probably are having a, a big impact on what's happening lake-wide from a parasite population perspective. Lakes also display some incredible variation between each other when you compare the avian schistosome populations. And so Walloon Lake is different than Glen Lake and it's different than, um, than Lake Leelanau. And so I think the idea of a silver bullet that's a one-shot fits all lake control program is probably not really gonna work because we know that Walloon Lake, if you got rid of T. stegniculae, you would still have a big problem with this new species of trichobilharzia. At Glen Lake, if you got rid of T. stegniculae, you might actually have really done a good job of reducing your swimmer's risk. Um, so one lake's solution is not a solution for every lake. And then finally, um, we know that these specific swimmers are causing parasites. Um, this, there's these free sites. They, they don't seem to have the parasites at them for whatever reason. And so um, it'll be important as we move forward to start trying to figure out why are they absent of the parasite. And are those factors consistent such that site G8 at Glen Lake is always a swimmer's itch free site, basically? Um, or you know, does it become something else as the parasite population shift? So those will be some questions that we want to try to answer moving forward. So as I move into um, sort of the next, the final part of this talk, um, I want to tell a story. It's a story that uh, essentially Rob already told you. Um, I'm going to show it to you with just a slightly different way of, of saying it. I want to draw your attention to a publication that Harvey Blankespoor and Ron uh, published in 1991, Control of Swimmer's Itch in Michigan, Past, Present, and Future. I don't remember what the art journal is, the Michigan Academian. Um, and in that article, there's this quote. Uh, the authors believe that there are maybe as many as 20 species of non-human schistosomes in Michigan alone. This is a statement made in 1991. So this has been the way I've seen it as kind of an outsider that's now maybe an insider. When I first started working on this project, it was 2016, I think, when I came to Michigan to start working on this. And I, coming from Alberta, where we have a lot of parasite diversity, we have 80, 80 plus species of digenetic trematodes in our lakes. So we have a big struggle trying to figure out what's going on with all this parasite biodiversity. In 1991, we knew there was a lot of species of, of avian schistosomes in Michigan. But then through routine sort of uh, a continuous sort of focus on control, um, I think things kind of narrowed down to this sort of hourglass of T. stegnicolae being the main thing. Right, Merganza relocation became kind of the narrow focus of control efforts because it was the thing that was most tangible as a control effort. Um, and Rob really, really nicely laid that whole story out for you. But I think we're kind of now, um, as we start to shift our focus back to just trying to understand the big picture here, we're moving back to this big, wide space where um, in 2020, we have a number of species that we know are important and a number of birds and snails that we know are important. And now we have new tools that allow us to, to look at these things in a different way. But it's important for us to recognize that it's not as simple as one parasite, one snail, one bird. Okay? And I think that you know we knew that in 1991 at least. But it was just through this effort of control that we really ended up narrowing our focus a little bit. So the final thing I want to talk about today in this talk is species-specific qPCR analysis of Merganza relocation sites. And so here, um, I'm going to go through this part um, pretty quickly because I think a lot of you are pretty aware of some of this. But there, uh, through the number of years, has been this effort to relocate mergansers. 
Um, and there are these approved relocation sites um, that are highlighted on this map in red. So you can see them all kind of around this, this little tip of the mitt. And um, as part of our study, we uh, decided we were going to analyze the water samples at those locations for these different species of parasite to see what is the composition at the relocation sites of terms just causing parasites. Is there any? Because the, the theory is that these relocation sites are devoid of the, the proper snails to complete the life cycle of T. stegnicolae, right? If you are relocating this, these birds there, the hope is that you're not just going to cause a huge swimmer's dish problem um, in Sutton's Bay, right? And so um, what we found is that there are schistosomes cercaria um, that were detected at three of the seven uh, DNR approved relocation sites. Um, they're highlighted here in red. So East Tawas relocation site had a number of positive sample sites that are these um, little yellow pins. The red circles are the sites that were, we found uh, cercaria at using the pan-avian schistosome assay. And then uh, Hodenpile uh, Pond and Tippy Dam Pond also had a few positive sites. Um, and then um, because we had these anecdotal reports of, of swimmer's itch um, right probably out there, um, we had a number of sites that were collected in the Traverse City uh, area. And so these were the sample sites. And you can see there was a few sample sites that gave us positives for swimmer's itch causing parasites. Now that isn't necessarily shocking because we know that there are all these species, right? And all those species can contribute to swimmer's itch. Uh, and so, you know, that pan-avian assay doesn't get of us a focus that's, that's, you know, high enough resolution to say what species it is. So, um, so that, you know, nice convenient situation is that we have a, a species specific qPCR assay we can use on those same samples. So um, just so you know, these are places that we had swimmer's itch reports um, sent in um, from people who said they got swimmer's itch at these sites. And then we took those locations where we got positive pan-avian schistosome assay results and uh, we analyzed them using the species specific assay. And so um, we know that the novel species, the one that goes through the Helosoma snails, is present at, uh, at uh, two of the sites, three of the sites, sorry. The Tippy Pond, Hodenpile Pond, and East Tawas have the novel species, this new species, going through Helosoma snails. T. stegnicolae was found at the Hodenpile Pond and East Tawas. And I highlight these in red because I'm going to come back to that in a second. T. Ficelli, uh, which goes through Physid snails and mallards, is found at Hoden Pile and Grand Traverse Bay. And then we have a couple unknown species which are positive for the pan-avian assay, but we don't have a species-specific assay that detected a positive. So it's some other species, which there's a lot of species that I've shown you on that figure that we just don't, we don't know. So this is important because T. stegnicolae is the parasite that goes through mergansers and stegnicola amarginata snails. And so these two two positives here suggest that um, there needs to be some evaluation of, um, of what that means in terms of relocation of mergansers at these sites. Um, because we do know now that because we can find these parasites in the water, that that would indicate that there are the elements to complete the life cycle at these, some of these relocation sites. So I'm going to summarize everything with that, and then I'm going to summarize uh, sort of the, the talk here. Um, so we know mergansers are mobile birds. Um, you know, uh, Kurt Blankespoor uh, and Randy de Jong, they, uh, their uh, MSIP-supported uh, project was to track mergansers after this relocation. And um, they presented that, you know, when you put a bird at a relocation site, it moves around a lot. Um, and so it's not unlikely to think that if you took a bird and you put it at one relocation site, it could travel around a whole bunch and potentially, um, you know, poop, and release Myricidia at a lot of different places around um, uh, in this area. So the presence of T. stegnicolae is really important to consider um, because that, that means that we have the, that snail, S. marginata, is present at, in proximity to the relocation sites. The relocation impact uh, is, is likely um, there. There's going to be an impact of the, on the ecology um, at these sites. And so moving forward, some of our uh, questions relate to, you know, what are the impact um, on just in general um, of relocating the birds, putting them at a site, or taking them from all these sites, um, and removing a top predator from lakes that you guys are on. Um, so the real question that I think we, you know, we're trying to get at here is, it doesn't eliminate T. stegnicolae from the lake, like Glen Lake shows when you have a three-year relocation effort. 
Um, and you may be just moving it, the, moving the problem to a new location, um, because we know that we can find this parasite in the water at relocation sites. So the, the question I think that needs to be asked is, is it worth it? Is, this, is there a future for Magranza relocation? So um, I left you with a few pieces of information, bombs maybe. Um, so I want to I want to um, I want to just wrap everything up with some comments on uh, swimmers itch and beyond. So what do we see being the future of all of this now? Um, and so Ron and I have always thought about this as having a long term vision, um, and I think that that's really played out to our advantage in the sense that um, you know being able to archive samples and analyze new samples with qPCR is a, an invaluable way that we got a species specific qPCR assay up and running so quickly, um, and now we're able to 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 design this huge community-based program that uh, took these three lakes and really gave us a, a level of resolution at those lakes for their swimmer's itch that we have never seen before um, for swimmer's itch or, or uh, really for parasites like this in general. So we found this new species of parasite that causes swimmer's itch. We have these five qPCR assays. We have this, um, this program that involves a whole bunch of community partnership um, with all of you um, that's really collected this this comprehensive data set that's, um, that you know, I, I am not aware of something that rivals it. Um, we've been able to demonstrate that um, the relocation effort of mergansers, this sort of maybe one dimensional aspect of, of control, is probably not going to solve the swimmer's itch problem because we have other species that cause swimmer's itch. And we know that the relocation doesn't seem to remove the parasite it's really trying to remove from a lake. So the spring and fall migrating birds are likely contributing enough parasite material to the lake to maintain an infection prevalence in the snails that's sufficient to continue to release enough parasites to cause swimmer's itch. So what's next? Um, we, I think, have a few things that are of interest to us from a research perspective. Um, are we, I would really like to know is the swimmer's itch profile, so that big heat map, is that profile a static profile or do, how much does it change year to year at a lake? And is that change predicated on changes in the snail population that we can then use to predict year to year how a snail population in one year might then predict what your swimmer's itch composition might be the next year? And does that then help you figure out, well, these are the things we need to worry about from a control perspective? Are sites where avian schistosomes are present or low or absent, are they consistently low risks? And does that then help us des designate sites on lakes that might be reasonable places for people to swim? Do all species of avian schistosome display the same shedding behavior and, um, and presence in the water column? Does this new species have different behavior that um, means that we have to think about it differently from a control perspective? And then finally, um, how do we control swimmer's itch given the complexity of the situation here? And I think this is the question that will probably be every in everyone's mind is now what do we do? Because it's not as easy as we thought. And um, I think Ron is going to try to address that in his talk that comes up next. So I'm going to wrap it up because I know I'm over time a bit. Um, so I have a lot of people to acknowledge, um, but really um, we have a, a whole team of people at the University of Alberta that have been really core to this because um, I certainly um, am now incapable of running qPCR by myself. It's changed too much. So I'm not an expert anymore, but we have people like uh, my former student, Sydney Rudko, who's been a really um, big driver of this. Um, but then also the Freshwater Solutions team, because they are the reason that I'm here um, and able to work in this place and talk to you. Um, and then all of our community partners who collected samples for us last year, every Tuesday between 8 and 10. Um, that's a big ask from us, but it's led to us understanding things in a way we've never been able to understand before. So that was a huge um, initiative, a huge endeavor, and it's really appreciated. And with that, I will stop and let Ron yep. do his Thank thing. You. So let's take a look at this, uh, preventing swim itch with 2020 vision. So moving forward, now we, what we've learned, all this, these data, what does that mean? And I'm going to suggest a paradigm shift. Rob alluded to it at the very beginning, and I'm going to play off from that and, uh, and talk here. So most of us, as I look around, not all, most of us remember the 1980s. And we remember that our country was gripped with fear because of this AIDS virus. And it started in the, like, 81, and people started dying, and it was largely in the homosexual community at first, 
And then people were really, really, for the, a few years into the mid-80s, we were scared. We were, oh, can you get it from, from typing, using a typewriter that somebody else used? Or can you get it from shaking hands? And how about if somebody coughs and they're next to you and they cough? We were uh, literally uh, worried. Maybe not unlike the coronavirus that we don't know where that's headed, right? But there's some, you can feel some of that tension. That was happening in the 1980s. This guy, C. Everett Koop, was the uh, Surgeon General during the Reagan years. And he believed in education, and so they set out learning more about this virus. They did something unprecedented. They sent out a, uh, a flyer to every uh, address in the United States. 107 million of these went out to educate people about this virus. And he did several public service announcements, and I was a teacher for 32 years high school teacher, biology teacher, and I would show, when we'd study viruses, I would show one of his public service announcements about AIDS. This was in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s. And at the very end, after he had explained, you can't get it from shaking hands, you can't get it from somebody coughing on you, you don't get it from using the typewriter, he, he relieved everybody, and then he made this statement, which has stuck with me. He said, so, and you pointed, he has a presence, right? He would say, so. You don't have to get AIDS if you don't want to. Because we've learned enough. We learned enough about it that you really don't have to get AIDS. The NIH came out with a document that said, above all, Coop helped the nation face the most fearsome new pandemic of the century, AIDS. I highlighted this in red. He educated the public on prevention and protection. Now, they put this out. There's a simple way to prevent AIDS. And you won't be able to read the bottom there, but here's what it says. You want to be risk-free from AIDS? Don't have sex. <laughs> well, I know. So with swimmer's itch, we can say, you, I have the answer. Patrick made it really complicated. I am going to simplify your life. You don't want to get swimmer's itch? Don't swim. Now, we know we want people to have sex. We want to have people swimming, and so that's not the answer. However, however... We do have some things that we have learned. This tool, this technique, and, and Patrick uh, is, is a, certainly an expert. Uh, I learned everything uh, about that from him. But this, this one qPCR, counting the worms in the water. We learned more in the last three years than I, I've been working on this since 1977 as an undergraduate in college. And we've learned more in the last three years than I did the previous 40. And it's because of this new technology that we could answer this question, how many worms and what species of worms are in the water. And I hope you got a feel for that in, the, in Patrick's talk that he just gave. So let's take a look at some of the things we've learned and what that means and where we went with that. Glen Lake, we said, well, you know what? We know that they come out in the morning, these parasites every morning, the snails that are infected release these cercari. So let's take a look and let's actually measure that. So we had eight locations around Glen Lake, and we, had, we collected samples at 8 o'clock in the morning, noon, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and 8 o'clock at night. Same location, same spot, and here's what we found. Here's what we learned, that at 8 o'clock in the morning, I wouldn't swim. Okay? At noon, it went down. At 4, it went down and stayed low until 8, because these are food sources. These are like the mosquitoes of the aquatic, of the terrestrial system. These cercaria are a food source, okay? They're glycoprotein. And so they, and they only live for a day, so they die. Uh, and so by the end, of, by later in the afternoon, it's uh, not, there aren't as many in the water. So what's the prevention method? So we're going to talk about methods of what we learn here. Swim in the afternoon on high-risk days. Now, some of you aren't going to like all of these, and say, so don't use them. Say, well, I want to go swim in the morning, okay? But these are ideas, these are prevention strategies. He said, well, we know that they uh, are negatively geotropic, meaning they, they, when they come out of the snail, they go up. But let's show that we wanted to show that out in the lake. So we invented this tube with valves that you could just clunk the tube, close the valves, and then you'd, you'd capture uh, columns of water. We did that many, many times to fill 25 liters for each one. We ran qPCR. 
and we discovered that most of the scary are in the very top few centimeters of water. There was none that we found in the middle section, and in the bottom, there were a few, and those are probably dead ones, because this qPCR works on DNA, whether it's dead organism, live organism, okay? Prevention method, avoid floating with your arms and legs near the surface in shallow water. So this gal right here, it looks happy, but these right, if there, if there are snails and sort they, they're, we know they're, in, they're right there, and she's not gonna be happy in a little bit. So that would not be uh, something you'd wanna do on those kind of days. The effect of wind. We have hundreds of samples. Tom Raffle has hundreds of samples. We have shown that the wind is a, a, a very good predictor of onshore wind, a predictor, and what happens is the wind blows, the circari move. I think the good uh, picture, mind picture on this is like pollen in the spring. And you see them, it's yellow out there, and, and that's, that's basically what these circari are like. And so they're gonna get moved around, they might get in this little pocket, or they might move down the shore. So we know onshore wind, in fact, we did a study, this is a, a little take home. We took samples in the first half meter so the water is only this deep, right? First half meter. And the number of circaria in there is astronomical. So that's the two-year-old. So I have two granddaughters. And I don't want my youngest one to be in that little bit right there if there's an onshore wind, right? So we, can, we educate ourselves to that. So what did we learn? Risk of swimmer, swimmer's itch decreases with an offshore or a longshore wind. It increases with an onshore wind. So prevention method, pay attention to the wind and avoid swimming in shallow water with an onshore wind. So be careful with an onshore wind. All right, so hold on, now let's take what we've learned. They come out in the morning. They're, so they're released right away in the morning. As soon as the sun comes up, they're released. They go to the surface and they get blown around. So then the idea was, well, why don't we put a baffle up near the surface and then how about let's remove snails on, in the area where you're swimming. And so what we did is we bought some baffles. And by the way, these are made for oil, containing oil spills in the ocean. We're trying to protect against microscopic organisms. So this is overkill, okay? But it's what was on the shelf, it's what we could get. So we created these spots. We collected, removed the snails. Then we collected water samples inside and ran qPCR. We collected water outside and ran qPCR for four days afterwards at multiple sites. And the green is uh, the circari after, and the blue are the circari that we found, I'm sorry, inside and outside. So the blue is inside where there were no snails, and the green is outside where there were snails. Another interesting thing, and Patrick showed you this, but on this day, and this day, the snails released a lot, and on this day, and these are just one day apart. This day and this day, they're just, it wasn't a bad day. to Now, if we could figure out why that is, that would be great, right? You could say, it's a green flag swimming day, or it's a red flag swimming day, and if we could figure that out, and we hope to do that, um, that would be great. Anyway, so prevention method, create a safer swim area with baffles, remove the host snails. It took us less than an hour, by the way, to remove all the snails in that 50 by 50 area with our wetsuits and masks. But here's an idea, and we haven't tried this, but what if you were to remove the snails and install these snail barriers along, like on the, on the bottom, so the snails can't get back in, because snails move around. Uh, an idea, okay, we haven't tested that. And we thought, you know what, let's not remove the snails because snails are good. Snails eat the algae. What causes swimmer's itch again? Circari. So what if we just destroyed, and they're fragile, they break apart right there between the head and the, the tail. Uh, what if we could just somehow smash them so that they don't have their, they can't you know, burrow under our skin? And they're more dense than water, so they'll sink when they break apart. So we invented the smasher. Uh, it's, it's a... <laughs> It's a pump, this is for in the pool, it pulls off the top layer of water, we run it through the centripetal force, it blow it against the screen. So what we did was we just raked for 15 minutes, we raked, just pulled it back and forth, we, we took a water sample before, and then we did this, and what did we learn? 
that smash the numbers are carried before, numbers are carried after. So you can smash them. So the prevention method mechanically destroys their carry before swimming with or without baffles. You don't really have to have the baffles. If you go out in front of your place, smash them, you're going to be good for a while. Okay? Then we thought, well, that's a little brutal to, to smash them. What if we just raked them? So these are rakes that are made for pools, for leaves, you know, fall in the, and they have a pole, and you just you go along and you rake the leaves off the top, right? We replace the netting with 20 micron mesh netting so that the circari can't get through. Took the pole off, it's easier with just with a rope, and we pulled. Then we thought, let's put, grand, let's put the grandkids to work. Let's get her, they make these for pools as well. They're remote control boats that have a net that picks up the leaves. But let's replace that with 20 micron mesh, and then let's just go around and you know, scoop around, and what we found when we'd use just the rake for five minutes, we went from that to that, before and after. When we rake for 20 minutes, not quite as severe. When we did the rake, and we named that dragnet, the boat, uh, USS dragnet, but anyway, we did five and five, and then we said, well, let's do 10 and 10, 20 minutes of work, and we basically got rid of all the circari in that area because they come up to the top. So the prevention method, mechanically remove circaria before swimming with or without baffles. You don't have to have the baffles. You just go out and remove, and then the kids can swim, and you'd probably greatly reduce your uh, chance of swimmer's itch. Now, another thought, and we didn't try this, but they make these. They're solar-powered. They're Roomba-style pool skimmers. Just replace the little net with 20-micron net, and it goes around. And they claim in, like in sunny climates, it, it goes for 23 and a half hours a day. You, you just let it go. So if you had like a swim, uh, it wouldn't even have to be a baffle. It could just be a swim rope where this thing couldn't get out, and you just let it go. And it's just going around scooping up the top little layer of water. Um, you wouldn't even need the grandkids to help clean up the, the area. We haven't tried that. They're $500. That Roomba thing is $500, so we didn't do it. But. We're always trying to get less expensive and simpler. We said, well, let's, what about this? What if we simplified this whole baffle thing? Do we really need to make an enclosed area? And we said, if there's no wind, and we put a baffle along the dock, just along the dock, so it's not, it doesn't look so bad, it's just along the dock, we would expect that the snails are going to be everywhere, the circari are going to be everywhere if there's no wind. So we put seven of these out on three or four different lakes, and then we would test with qPCR again. Everything goes back to qPCR. We would test the water on one side and on the other. And what we found when there's very little wind, less than three mile an hour wind, you had 165 versus 100, you really didn't, it didn't, less than that, it didn't do much. That baffle really didn't do much. Well, we wouldn't expect it to do much. But when the wind started to blow, we would expect all these are carried to be piled up here and we'd expect these circari that were released in the morning come up to the surface to be blown down shore. And so we did testing at four different sites, and we went from 44 essentially to eight. So we created a little safe area, kind of like out of the wind it would be if you were thinking about wind and blowing sand. It's kind of like out of the wind that you could swim in that area and have a, a reduced chance of swimmer's itch. Now, all of these things, eliminate what birds, what species, how complicated. It's like you don't care at that point. You just, you care about, like I care about, your grandkids or your kids, or you, not getting swimmer's itch. So prevention method, install a perpendicular baffle. Uh, I have to point this out. So that's my granddaughter and my uh, son-in-law. And they went swimming. This is Lime Lake, where we have a place, right in Leelaw County and they got swimmer's itch this summer, 2019. So skin in the game, right here, skin in the game. And Chris right away said, those baffles are sitting there. Can I put the baffles out? Yeah, put the baffles out. So Chris went and put these baffles out. And 15 minutes later, this is, look at all of this on one side. The wind was this way. So you can see what it does. It, it, it stops all of the stuff that's floating. Uh, and then, so then you could swim here. So the idea is this. Um, Swim on the lee shore, right? That's the uh, 
installed baffle swim on the lee side. This was this fall. It was early October, and I was on the internet uh, looking for ways to prevent swimmers itch. Imagine that. And I came upon this, these rash guards. And I have to admit, I didn't know what a rash guard was. And I guess people that are in the, by the ocean, they wear rash guards. And I thought, is this like Occam's razor? Occam's razor is basically the kiss, the keep it simple, stupid, right? It's like go the simplest route. And rash guards are just swimming suits that cover your body. And so if we, the kids, and again, maybe the adults aren't as interested, but for the kids, for the grandkids, put on your, um, on your rash guard and go swimming. And uh, there, there's the kids' version. And so I did buy a couple, and I have them here, and you can take a look at them afterwards, but it's just... <laughs> the, <laughs> who, so that's... Uh, for my granddaughter, and I did buy one for myself. I did, because I wanted to see what, it, what is it like. And I went in Lime Lake in October, because I wanted to see what does it feel like with this thing on. Added benefit, they are UPF 50 plus, which is 98.5% of the sun is protected, so you don't have to put the sunscreen on. And what's timely about this piece is that January 21, which is just a few weeks ago, this article came out, original research, the effect of sunscreen application on plasma concentration of sunscreen ingredients, a randomized clinical trial. And they found, you're going to be amazed at this, and I'd be happy to send you the article. They found that seven chemicals, after one application of sunscreen, seven chemicals were in your blood above the le level that was considered safe. They did it for 30 days, 30 applications, 30 days, but after the first application. And so I started thinking, and I told my daughter, because I care about my granddaughters, and it's like, you know what, we need to, we need to pay attention to this kind of research. But that, that eliminates that, because except for the face, obviously, uh, if you wear a rash guard. Now, I like this idea, and so I contacted Eco Stinger. It's just one of the brands. There are a lot of them out there. Uh, they're around the world. And I said, here's the scoop. I'm going to present this as a possible prevention strategy. If sales come from Michigan, I want to take the 20%. Would you donate? And I want to donate it to water quality, uh, prevent, uh, water quality issues here in northwest Michigan. And they said, OK, we'll do it. And so here's what you have to do, though. If you're interested, if this is one of those prevention strategies, uh, yeah, this, uh, this, let's try that. Here's what you have to do. I, have a, I hope this plays. So you have to Google. Right here, freshwatersol.com. That's our website. It's going to bring you up to our. You know, well, come to there. Go to the website. Now watch. Scroll down. I put their logo right there. Eco Stinger. Back up. And then click there, and it'll bring you right to their website. Anything you order on that. At that point, they're going to track to our, my website, and 20% of what you buy is going to be donated through me. It's going to be donated back to uh, nonprofits here in Northwest Michigan for water quality stuff. So, so if you're interested, I, I don't own stock in Eco Stinger. I'm going to get, I'm making zero on this, but I just thought, you know what, this is, this is part of what we do. And so anyway, you could get any brand if you're interested, but Eco Stinger, I, I would at least check them out, see if it's interesting to you. Okay. Um, oh, prevention method, wear a rash guard like these amateur models. <laughs> She's a lot cuter, uh, but I put one on. That's in October. I went in Lime Lake just because I wanted to see what it felt like, and they're thin, and you can check them out, but uh, cool idea. Now, there are other methods, and some of you out there, based on what I just showed you, your brains are going, and you're saying, I have an idea, and that's what we want. We want to, together, create other methods, prevention methods, and we want to test them. It's time now to test these. So I was on Facebook. I don't usually, I just read. And there's one uh, overheard in Lelon County. And so this past summer, there was a whole string of 100 and 200 posts. 
And these are all from that one post. For now, a hot soapy shower and rub the skin vigorously after with a dry towel. And you just have to dry off really well and it won't happen. And those who towel get nada, those who don't get it. So toweling off is what they're saying. Now, the, the, these are people that are the other, right? Grew up swimming in lakes with swimmer's itch. Mom lathered, us, lathered me up right after getting out with lava soap and let it dry on me. <laughs> wash them babies with Fels Napfa soap as soon as they get out. Works great and washes the itch right off. Before we even touched the water, Grandma rubbed us down with Avon skin, so soft oil. Okay? I had swimmer's itch from walking along the shoreline of Lake Huron in September last year. So miserable. If you get on the first day of vacation, I say, oh, roll, because we're relocating mergansers in Lake Huron, and so that might be an issue. I don't know where that was from. That, that's what was on the... Thing. But I do want to make the point, though. There are other things. We, we're, we're just trying to prevent swimmer's itch. And, and there are ideas. I have a half a dozen new ideas that I'm not sharing with you yet. Um, but um, I, I'm sure you have some. And we encourage you to, you know, that we work together to try to get somewhere. I have to do this. None of these prevention methods are guaranteed to eliminate, reduce, or prevent swimmer's itch. These prevention strategies and data are presented for educational purposes only. Swim at your own risk. And the reason I say that, this is a DNR, Michigan DNR sign. It says, warning, swimmer's itch. Swim at own risk. Dry yourself completely after coming from the water. Now, here's the interesting part about this. Patrick and I had a little discussion about this. And there's only one species that we know of that's sticky, and it's not found in northwest Michigan. And so when you come out of the water, they all just run off with the water. They don't, the other, the species that's sticky, then they would stick to you, okay? That one, it would, the toweling off, but biologically, probably toweling off probably doesn't, isn't effective in, in our neck of the woods, so to speak. But if it works for you, you should do it. <laughs> Right? That's our, if it works for you, you should do it. Now, here's what we'd like to do. We encourage a paradigm shift for now. And I say for now, just like the AIDS, they, they haven't quit working on AIDS prevention. It's still going on, right? We're still trying to get, and we're going to continue to look for lake-wide control measures. We're not giving up. This is not a, oh, well, we, it's too complicated. We're, no, not at all. Because... Maybe you didn't know, but this, these parasites here in Michigan are a model species, a model species for ones that cause schistosomiasis for 225 million people in the world, and it kills them. If we can come up with things that help us with our swimmer's itch, we can save lives with a similar species. And so there's reason for us to do this. There's a passion for us to, to look for ways and it might just be something that we do that somebody, some other scientist looks at and says, oh, well, we could do that, and, and it would actually help save people's lives. So we're going to keep working. It's what we've done our, our life, and I'm going to keep working on it. As we continue to pursue new lake-wide control me methods, let's implement these prevention strategies and assess their effectiveness. The last thing I wanted after these three years is for you to leave here and say there's nothing we can do. Because that's terrible. No, there is. I have... We're going to be on Lime Lake this summer, and my grandkids are going to be swimming, and we're going to do things, in, and I believe we're not going to get swimmers in. And we're, Lime Lake is not trapping mergansers anymore. We did for five years. And so we're, we're going to swim, I believe, itch-free or very little itch because of some of these prevention strategies. So I would encourage you to do that for now. I would also encourage your Lake Association and members to participate in our multiple year Swimmer's Itch Prevention Assessment Initiative beginning in 2020. I'll give you more information will be coming out to your Lake Association soon, but what we want to do is we want to put percentages on these prevention strategies. So if you use this or you use this or you use those two in combination, we want to know how many worms are in the water, what strategies did you use, and how effective was it, so that in, in uh, two or three years, we're going to be able to stand up here with a lot more knowledge and say, you know, if you do this, 
you can, you can reduce your risk by this much. And so that's an initiative that we're starting, uh, rolling out for 2020, and it, it would likely be like a three-year program to try to, to try a different thing. We'd like to have hundreds of data points uh, each, each summer. So our goal through education is to be able to say this, so you don't have to get swarmers itch if you don't want to. And that's our goal, that's our hope, by educating people and swimming at the right times or swimming in the right places or using the right prevention strategies that you really, we can swim and have fun up here in our beautiful lakes, beautiful lakes in northern Michigan. And on that, I would like to say one more time a thank you to all of these um, lake associations and volunteers that have made these last three years uh, possible for us, so thank you. Okay, let me just get to where I need to get to. Okay, so you'll be tired of hearing from me after this. Um, so the second thing I wanted to talk about, and this builds really well off of what Ron uh, just told you, is um, fostering community partnerships and water monitoring. And um, you know, this isn't uh, something that's new. Community-based monitoring and citizen science um, you could probably trace its roots back to water monitoring historically. It, it's um, something that's been used for a long time as a way to help expand the scope of water monitoring projects. Um, but I think what I'm hoping to get across to you here today is the novelty of incorporating DNA-based detection tools like qPCR into a citizen science and, and community-based monitoring effort. And I'll just maybe, before I go into what I want to, sort of my objectives, I'll just segue really quickly to the fact that um, Ron and uh, Freshwater Solutions were really kind of our first community partners here in Michigan and over the years their lab has grown and they've become essentially experts at, at QPCR. And I think his story that he just told you is a perfect example of kind of the, the long-term vision of what a community-based monitoring program based on DNA detection is really about because Ron and Freshwater Solutions was able to do all those cool control studies kind of independent of having to work with us on all that stuff, right? We can provide some sort of quality assurance on those results that he's doing, but, but he can take his creative mind and Sucaria Smashers and Roombas and all those things and just test them and do those kinds of experiments on his own without having to rely on us to be there. And that's kind of the goal of all of this, right? Is, as community partners become experts, the questions that you guys want to ask on your own can be things that you can just do. Um, and so you can start coming up with creative ways of testing whether or not swimmers' control efforts work um, using qPCR, and that lets us unify around a single method so that all of our results are comparable and we can find the best strategies for control. So what I want to talk about today, um, it, it kind of shifts gears a little bit. Um, oh, sorry. That's why. That's why it's not working. There, is that better? Okay. Okay. So now that we're actually working, um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. We've been talking about swimmers itch for a lot, uh, uh, most of the day, really. And I'm going to um, take a bit of a step away from swimmers itch here and talk a little bit more about just community-based monitoring using qPCR in general. Um, and this is a, an ongoing program that uh, my lab has in Alberta. And it's also extended uh, here as well. And so um, I'll talk to you a little bit about the vision and, and what we would like to do with this program. Um, and so I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about um, community-based monitoring and qPCR. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a few of the case studies that I can tell you about um, using qPCR in a community-based context um, and, and uh, emphasize the kinds of things that we can learn when you have, you know, essentially an army of people working towards the same goals. And finally, um, I'm going to talk about enteric bacteria because I know uh, in parallel to swimmer's itch, enteric bacteria is another hot topic here in Michigan, um, as I think it is almost everywhere where there's recreational water. Um, and so um, it's something that I want to give a little bit of uh, talk to, um, because it's another topic that I think is relevant to this conversation, because qPCR is a really useful way of monitoring for enteric bacteria. So um, I wanted to, I, I didn't really properly introduce where I'm from, so 
Um, I'm from the University of Alberta, um, which is this little red overlay, and you guys are really comfortable with where Michigan is. So this is an overlay of Alberta. We're a really big province in Canada. We're just above Montana. Um, and we kind of have, we share the Rocky Mountains with British Columbia, and then that moves down and, and goes south. Um, we're, we're a big province, and we have a lot of lakes. Our lakes are, are very eutrophic, which means that they have a lot of algae. They're really shallow. They're warm, and we have a lot of vegetation that grows in them. And so our water issues are a little bit different than the ones that you guys typically deal with here, um, especially up, up here. Um, but water is a lot bigger than just recreational water, and, and so I want to kind of expand our scope a little bit and make sure that we're not just considering recreational water when we think about community-based monitoring, because it also includes wastewater and stormwater, recreational water, and drinking water. These are elements of water that are all important, not just from uh, a recreational perspective, but from a health perspective. And we have to start thinking about water in a big picture context because, as we all know, water scarcity is becoming a more important topic these days. And so we need to start thinking about um, how do we manage and better, uh, better deal with our water uh, from a big picture. And I think community-based monitoring is, a, is an element of, of that conversation. So um, focusing back in on Michigan, uh, there's a lot of issues with water here. Um, and it's not hard to find out what those issues are. Um, Michigan is large. It has a lot of inland lakes. Um, and there's lots of storm catchment areas and runoff events that happen from areas that have high septic system densities um, and things like that that can contribute different types of hazards to different types of water. So there are also a lot of different types of targets to monitor for, and we talked about swimmer's itch, but that's a very specific water hazard that uh, is found in the context of a whole bunch of other things, like enteric bacteria, cyanobacteria, um, which are sort of these saprozoic targets, or enteric bacteria targets, um, but also invasive species and things like that, which are more environmental. And so while some targets uh, that I just mentioned have associated policy, like enteric bacteria, there are others that um, can or may not cause health impacts that are still really relevant targets that we need to think about um, for various questions. And it's also, as we've shown you through the talks today, water is very dynamic. And so um, it can be really tricky to monitor for certain types of hazards because they can be very transient in water. And so this is all playing towards the strength of using a community partnership to monitor water because sometimes frequency is just as important as the sample itself, the frequency of the sampling. So our community-based monitoring solution to some of these issues um, is to try to unify testing around qPCR. And I'm going to try to make a case for why that's a, a, an important thing to do in the next few slides. And we also um, are advocating for decentralizing some of this testing. Certainly, um, you know, the, the targets that have regulatory levels associated with them, like enteric bacteria, those can be tricky things to move away from a regulatory lab because, um, you know, if you come up with a value for an enteric bacteria target at your lake that exceeds a regulatory guideline, then what happens? Right? Do you call the Michigan State EPA and tell them, hey, we got a really high enteric bacteria count from a citizen science qPCR machine down the road. Um, what are we going to do about it? Um, you know, and certainly Michigan State EPA probably doesn't want to receive a thousand phone calls every day from people who are running qPCR tests and exceeding guidelines because um, that would also be maybe tricky. That might be the word I'll use. Um, so decentralization is an important thing to do, but it's also important to understand the limitations and to understand how a community-based program moves forward in the context of the regulatory frameworks that some of these targets have. We need to properly train citizen scientists so that we can trust them. And I think that that trust comes with repetition and it comes with routine uh, sampling. And as we gain experience and as community scientists gain experience, then we gain trust in their abilities to run these tests. And that becomes a really important relationship. They become more confident and we become more confident in them. <clears throat> and so our idea here and sort of the, the, you know, the way to think about this is to really start democratizing water monitoring to expand the scope of water monitoring projects. Right? If you can all run qPCR, um, then that really gives a lot more legs to us to be able to really think about water monitoring projects in a way bigger scale than what currently happens. Okay? So I want to emphasize that there are lots of different types of targets. Right? We talked about swimmer's itch, which um, fits right here. I'll turn my little laser pointer on here. Right in here, um, where it kind of touches the interface of health and economics and environment. But there are other types of targets. The, the fecal bacteria, um, fecal coliforms are sort of the old school way of doing it. Uh, we're kind of onto this enterococcus or human source tracking markers now. They interface between health and economics, certainly, because you might have a beach get closed if you exceed a regulatory guideline for an enteric bacteria. 
but they're also a health risk, and that's why there's a guideline there for them. We also have these environmental targets that can have a health effect, things like Legionella and other saprozoic um, targets. Um, Legionella being a really important one um, that is probably kind of an emerging thing here in the US, just like it is in Canada, that's associated with in-premise plumbing and um, drinking water distribution systems. And then we have these ones that are in economic and environmental issues, things like invasive mussels, invasive fish populations, and things like that. Um, and so that's where you have less of a health impact, but you certainly have these other types of targets. Um, and our, our objective here is to try to unify testing around a single method. And qPCR, because all these targets are biological in nature, they all have DNA. That's been said before. And so we can design qPCR tests for all of those types of things. And there's lots of work that's already been done to de design qPCR tests for a lot of the really important health targets. But there's a lot less work that's gone into some of these other targets. And that's where our program really tries to supplement. And so we have expertise designing these types of tests. And our goal is to try to design tests that are suitable for the kinds of questions that community partners have so that we can answer your questions and we can answer questions related to these bigger, more sort of regulatory type targets. So community-based monitoring can be envisioned as sort of three different types of models. And um, there's certainly lots of gray area and transition between these model types. Um, but these are the three that we tend to see most frequently. Um, so model A is this situation where a researcher like me designs a project and I, I come up with um, all this sort of study design and then I ask you guys to go and do something for me, like collect some samples because I only have one grad student and I need 20 to do the study I want to do. Um, so you guys go and collect samples and then I get all that sample back and then I get all the data and then I publish a paper. And that's kind of a pretty one-way street. You know, I probably thank you somewhere along the way. Um, but, but that doesn't really do much for you guys unless that question is something that you guys are really interested in answering um, and having an answer, answer to. Uh, and, but you haven't really been involved in designing that question. And so some questions are great for that. And sometimes, um, you know, there's lots of great analogies for this, but sometimes that's just the right model for a community-based program, right? Sometimes you don't want to have to come and meet with me a whole bunch of times and come up with questions and have your input on that stuff. Sometimes you just want to know the answer to a question, and then this model works really well for that. Model B is, is a bit of a hybrid between the two extremes. And so in this one, I, I'll still be involved in designing a, a, a question and a project, um, but we do consult with you, and we talk to you afterwards about the data and what the data means. And so situation A could kind of be like, you know, I just get you guys to get the sample, and I get the results, and then you might get a report back, and then we've stopped communicating after that. Um, Model B is more uh, integrated in terms of communication about what the results means and what maybe happens next. And so we, we're more, it's more of a partnership, but it's not a complete partnership. And so Model C is, is that vision, where there's a complete partnership between the researchers and the community partners. This is where we sit down and we design a question together. And we have to be transparent about the questions that I need to get asked and answered and the questions that you need to get asked and answered. And, and so in that situation, we try to come to a consensus on, well, you guys might be interested in enteric bacteria and swimmer's itch, and I might be interested in swimmer's itch and something else. And so can we unify around a testing method and a water sampling approach that allows us to answer all three questions with the same water sample using qPCR? And that's why qPCR is a really valuable element to this vision of community-based monitoring. Because if we were trying to answer three different questions using more traditional methods like culture-based detection of enteric bacteria, and you know, a flow camera for cyanobacteria, and then snail infection rate for swimmer's itch, that's three really big things that we, had to, we would have to do, right? And as the doers of the collecting that typically goes to the community partners, you know, that would mean that you're collecting 1,000 snails at a site, a water sample for a toxin analysis for cyanobacteria, and you have to grab an enteric bacteria sample and then culture it. Um, so not many of you probably have the capacity to culture a level two pathogen in your house. You probably don't want to. Um, and so this is where qPCR can be a really valuable tool because we can unify around a single, a single method that allows us to answer questions about a lot of different biological targets using a single collection program. So the vision here is really that, that we can kind of serve as this central hub. The, that's sort of your researcher hub. And then we have these satellite quality control hubs. And so right now, a good example of that is there's the University of Alberta in my lab, which serves as this sort of central quality control hub where we help design the research questions. But then Freshwater Solutions serves as this hub, where they're running a whole bunch of samples that are being collected by a bunch of 
people in the community. And that's, that's all these people. And these can look very different. So sometimes this hub might be a school, and these might be students at the school, and they're asking a specific question. Um, and so there's a lot of different models that this could work for. And really, it's all about just trickling down the samples so that the one that's in the middle is really just ensuring that everybody's getting good data, good quality data. And then, and then it all hinges on making sure that the conversation happens between this group, this group, and these people all together to make sure that the questions are answering something that everyone's interested in. Okay? And that interest is really critical because if you guys aren't interested after the first year, then you're not going to want to go out every Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. to collect another water sample the next year. Right? And then that, that breaks the data set for us. It makes it tricky because then we don't have the kind of data we need to tell a story that we can publish. That's my currency as a researcher is the publications. But the research, I think, as we've demonstrated today, is foundational to understanding the dynamics of these types of organisms so that you guys can not get swimmer's itch in the future. So CBM, as I mentioned, has been a part of water monitoring for ages. And so tools like these, like Secchi depth measurements, water chemistry analyses, probes, and zooplankton nets, these are the tools of community-based monitoring historically. In Alberta, we have the Alberta Lake Management Society that has been doing community-based outreach for 20 or 30 years. Um, and I've heard already here that there's another pro there's many programs here in Michigan that are very parallel, even older, that have been doing community-based monitoring. Um, and so uh, there's, these are often the tools that are used. They're not always the tools that are used. One of the issues that has been levied against these is that there's this interpretation element of them. And so what I, what I think is the secchi depth of a lake, somebody else might think is something slightly different. And so from a, from a critique perspective, from an academic perspective, there's often a criticism levied against citizen science that there's a lot of variability in citizen science. Um, and that's, that's true, but there's also the counter argument, which is that, well, we would have never had that sample without citizen science, so a sample is better than nothing. Um, and so um, there's that element of it as well. And I think it's also important to recognize that as people become more comfortable with any of these tools, they become more accurate and better, and their data becomes more reproducible, which is kind of a real important currency for publication, right, is reproducibility of the, of the data. What's unique? about what we're proposing is that we're proposing to use this technology, qPCR, in the same way that we've been using some of these other tools. Um, and this is really because now we can use qPCR cheaply. So before, you know, this was the, the kind of the purview of a research lab or a central core laboratory testing water on a thirty dollars or $40,000 qPCR machine, which was something that, you know, you couldn't move it around. You certainly wouldn't be buying them for a bunch of community partners to have sitting in their garage. Um, running these kinds of samples. And so now you can buy these machines. Um, they're much cheaper, maybe four or $5,000. They run a few less samples, um, and they're slightly less sensitive than the big core machines. But you can put these all over the place. And we can stick these in a suitcase-sized Pelican case with all the machines, all the other equipment you would need to run qPCR. And we can move them around really easily. And so this is kind of what's led us get to this point where we can do qPCR in a community-based way. So uh, before I move on to the next part, I just want to summarize some of this. Um, this Im uh, these important points are that this qPCR approach lets us use a single method for monitoring all these different organisms. And that while the biology is complicated, qPCR is actually really pretty easy. It's kind of like baking cookies. I know some people can't bake cookies. You, if you know you can't bake cookies, you probably don't want to be the person running the qPCR machine. <laughs> but it is, it's, it's, just, it's just following a recipe. And the recipe just includes volumes that are smaller than a drop of water. And so you just have to get comfortable with that method. But we know that with a series of videos and some hands-on training, almost anybody can do this. Okay? It's, not, it's, not, it's not really difficult. And the nice thing is, is that what we do is we provide the quality control. So we set up the tests and all the controls that are required to make sure that you're doing qPCR properly. And so, that allows us to disconnect you from some of the more important criticisms that will be levied against this, which is things like, you know, you might contaminate all of your samples with something or something like that. We set them up for you in a, in a well-designed qPCR facility so that you, all you have to do is just add the DNA you extracted. That's kind of the way it works. So like I said, we can design all these standards and these controls so that your accuracy and consistency can be evaluated. And because all organisms have DNA, we can easily incorporate a whole bunch of different targets um, in a monitoring program like this. And what's important to recognize is that this isn't something that we're, we're not breaking new ground by suggesting that we should be monitoring water with DNA-based detection tests. Um, 
many uh, monitor, water monitoring programs have moved to qPCR because it's more sensitive, it's more specific for targets, um, and it's a, a, a method that is fairly simplistic when you compare it to some of the other water monitoring tools that have been used. And this is actually the, a very appropriate place to be talking about because Michigan is uh, the first state in the United States to um, really implement qPCR from a public health uh, protection perspective in water monitoring programs. So qPCR is now has been used in Michigan for a while to monitor for E. coli in water um, as part of their beach monitoring program. And I'm going to show you some data from that beach monitoring program off of the website that you guys can all you can all access it and see water quality results off of that that are run in satellite state labs. And that's another really important, unique thing about Michigan um, lab testing is that a lot of states, it's centralized in certain specific locations. Michigan has started to decentralize those locations so that the sample transport time is less. Right? Rather than having to take a sample out there and then drive it to Detroit or wherever it might go, you know, there's actually a testing lab here. Um, and so that really um, de decreases a lot of variability associated with, the, with this type of sampling. The idea was community-based monitoring is very similar, right? You guys can take a sample and run that sample without having to drive it to freshwater solutions if this works out that way, right? So really quickly, um, I just want to emphasize something because we've talked about this already, um, but I just want to reiterate that that Swimmer's Itch program I talked about earlier, that is a, a perfect example of the kind of thing you can accomplish with community partnerships. And this isn't a small endeavor. So this accumulated time that was used for this project um, was over 800 hours of com community partner volunteer time to take water samples, drive samples around. So all that time, 800 hours of community volunteer time. We ran a, the Chai QPCR machine at Freshwater Solutions for over 100 hours. So that machine was running 100 hours um, analyzing samples. And um, Kelsey and, and the Freshwater Solutions team spent over 1,000 hours of time processing those samples for the pan-avian schistosome assay. There's 640 additional hours contributed by the students that Ron had recruited from Hope College. And then my PhD student spent 200 hours doing the species-specific assay, which are these 5,000 additional tests. And we have a bigger machine, so she can run more in a single sample. So, um, but that's still one person. And so this is a lot of time commitment. But if I was to say, let's do this sample program to Sydney, there's no way that she's doing that. There's no way it's possible to do it because of the scale of the program and the amount of time that would be required for somebody to do it, right? That would be her whole PhD would have just been spent driving around Michigan collecting water samples at lakes and doing PCR, and she probably would have killed me. And this is the kind of data you get from that. This is the kind of stuff you can generate, right? Multiple time points, multiple locations, multiple uh, sample sites on each lake. So you can get a huge spectrum of data with very comprehensive results that can really answer questions that you couldn't have answered without that level of, of information. So for the swimmer's itch perspective, we've learned a lot. We know that these, um, the Panavian test allows us to, to get an idea of swimmer's itch risk. It's a, it's a general test, but we can then use species-specific tests to ask more specific questions. And I'm leading this into the enteric question because this is kind of how it works for enteric bacteria too. So I'm trying to use this as a bit of an analogy for you. Performing these tests, um, you know, we can take the same water sample, the same water collection protocol, and we can test for all swimmers itch using the Panavian test or species that are specific to different um, uh, snails or, or bird hosts. And simplifying that method also allows us to take that water sample that we collected for swimmers itch, and we can use it for other types of targets if we want. So if you wanted to look to see if you had zebra mussel larvae in your sample, which I'm sure probably most of the lakes here have, um, but you could look for those things, because the zebra mussel villager larvae it would still be collected in a 20 micron zooplankton collecting net. And so there's lots of different ways you can apply this. And if you ever found out that, hey, there's a new thing that might be here, maybe it's proliferative kidney disease for you know, your trout or something like that, well, you could test for that because that parasite might have been collected in that sample. So again, we can really expand the scope and scale um, of our monitoring programs using this type of an approach. So I know that there's a, a good chunk of people here that are interested in enteric bacteria monitoring. And so I want to give a little bit of time to this. And I promise you that I will leave um, some time at the end of my talk for questions. And as Ron said, there'll be time afterwards if you have any other ones. So um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus just on enteric bacteria. And then also demonstrating to you that community-based partnerships using qPCR generate reliable data. Because that's something I want to make sure is clear um, by the end of all of this. So like I said, I'm going to give you an analogy here. And so this is, this is the way that our swimmer's itch testing works. We have this pan swimmer's itch test. And then when we get a positive test with that result, with that, uh, a positive result with that test, then we go in and we can do these species-specific assays. 
right? So that allows us to do a pre-screen, right? Because otherwise, you're going to be running five tests on every water sample, and a lot of them might be negative. So that's a huge waste of, of the sample, because the DNA sample is not infinite, right? It's 100, 100 microliters, so like the size of a drop of water. And you're using a small volume of that for every reaction. But if you were to run each of these five samples in triplicate, which is the convention for qPCR, then you're using 15 um, samples worth of the, of the DNA, and each of those is five microliters, so you're using up just over half of your DNA sample just for these tests. If you want to use it for something else later, you've got to be conscious of that. So we find that if you do this first, you can save yourself a lot of sample that might be valuable later. So for enteric bacteria, the story is very similar. Enteric bacteria, the typical convention is that you'll test for an indicator organism, which is an organism that indicates contamination from a fecal source, in the case of fecal bacteria, enteric bacteria. So, um, that can range depending on where you are. It, Michigan, it, they test for E. coli. And in a lot of other states, and, and where I am in Alberta, we test for Enterococcus. There's different reasons for these things. There's still questions about unifying around single targets. I think Enterococcus will probably end up being the test that most people re, so, sort of focus on. Um, and these targets are well-established qPCR tests. So these are US EPA methods that have been validated by probably hundreds of thousands of reactions that have been run in state labs across the United States, used in a variety of different contexts. So the enterococcus test, this is, for those that are interested, is US EPA method 1611. Um, and that test is a qPCR-based test that allows you to detect fecal contamination at a site. So that's a pretty general target. But there are regulatory guidelines related to those tests. So if you exceed a certain amount of enterococcus at a site, it doesn't matter what, what contributed that poop to your water sample. That beach is just really, got, is really poopy. And so you gotta, you got to just not let people go in it, because it's a risk. But there are situations where there is an interest to understand where did that fecal contamination come from. And this is called microbial source tracking. And this is really kind of getting down to the idea of then understanding what species of swimmer's itch parasites are causing swimmer's itch at your lake you can find out where the poop is coming from at your lake. And there's still a lot of work that's being done to put boundaries on these tests. There's lots of studies that, that you know, they, they continue to evolve the sort of scope of how these tests can be used. There's a, a number of human tests that are used. HF183 is the one that we tend to use most frequently in my lab, but there's also HUMM2 and B-theta. Um, these are all qPCR-based tests for human enteric bacteria. And they have slightly different parameters that are on them, but they all detect a very specific bacterial target that is specific to humans. Okay? Then there are ones for um, cows or ruminants. So RUM2 back or cow M2 or cow 8, oh. uh, cow something 2. Um, these, are, these are specific qPCR tests that have been designed for detecting cow poop in your water. There's a Canada goose test, CGO1. There's a seagull test, Lee Seagull. There's a dog test. There's tests for muskrats. There's lots of different source tracking tests that have been designed. OK, that's kind of my point. So the idea here, though, and the way that most water monitoring programs work is that they'll test for these fecal indicator bacteria. And it's, it's not very common that you move down to the source tracking test. It's, it's, there are some monitoring programs that do do that, um, but, they're, but that's not the convention yet, because there's just a lot more resources that go into a source tracking experiment. From the research angle, though, this is where there's a lot of interest because you can use this as your pre-screen. You find enterococcus or E. coli positive samples, and then you try to understand source. Okay? If you were looking at a sewage sample from a wastewater treatment plant, you're probably going to find a lot of human marker in that sewage sample. Right? But if you're looking at a rec water sample at a lake, who knows what you're going to find? You might find a lot of bird. You might find a lot of cow. You might find some human. And you might find nothing because the poop might be coming from something we don't have a test for. Right? So these are all things we have to think about. And as I mentioned, Michigan um, tends to focus on E. coli as part of their recreational mon water monitoring program. And Michigan actually has a very comprehensive inland lake beach monitoring program. But I want to emphasize a few points here, because it plays into why a community-based monitoring effort in this space is still something that we should think about. So this is these are values from the beach monitoring program uh, in Michigan. And these were just taken. They, there's nothing I'm trying to, no story I'm trying to tell with the data um, other than what I'm going to highlight here for you. So um, annually, there are about 200 inland lake beaches that are monitored. Okay? This is highlighted here in blue, so you can see total inland lake beaches monitored. A couple years is a lot, maybe over 200. A couple years is a little less. But out of those beaches, 
What's maybe a more interesting a, um, data point is that there's about 20% of those beaches that have an action. That action means that they've exceeded a guideline for E. coli. Okay? So now you have, you know, on an average each year, maybe 30 to 40 or 50 beaches that are flagged for exceeding a, a regulatory guideline. And then when we look at why those guidelines are being exceeded, most frequently it's because of a stormwater runoff event. And that's, that's a pretty common reason to have exceeded a, a fecal guideline. Stormwater, as a segue, is just kind of a black box of water, right? It's a kind of tricky place in water because, you know, if, if you start really thinking about what stormwater is, it's kind of like you have a storm event outside here and all that water that uh, is falling, it's running on all the streets, it's going into your storm sewers, it's going through your dog parks, it's all running down into your storm sewer system, and then it's going into your lake or your streams or your rivers um, untreated very often, right? It usually does not go to a wastewater treatment plant if it's stormwater. And so it's tricky because you could have a lot of dog poop from a dog park that's being run off from a ra rainwater runoff event, right? Or a bunch of bird poop that be is run off. And if you have uh, a really flash rain runoff event, that could be a very high concentration of those things. So the association of exceedance of a rec water guideline with stormwater runoff is not uncommon. And it's the number one cause in many places. Um, there's lots of really great studies from, from Ohio, lots of beaches in, um, in and around this area that have good studies done on them to show the association of runoff events um, and exceedance of rec water quality guidelines. But there's also a number of unknown sources of contamination that's highlighted here in yellow. And those unknown sources contribute a lot of days where beaches are being posted and advised against um, recreational use. And so those other events are, are interesting, and we don't really know what they are. Um, and so um, I'm not proposing that CBM is maybe the way to answer those questions, but uh, my point is that you have only 20% of the inland lake beaches are ever being monitored. They're not being monitored, all of them routinely. And there's a lot of unknown reasons that those beaches have high fecal contamination at them. And so there's lots of questions that are still um, answerable in this space. And I think that part of the issue with not knowing some of these answers is that um, the beach monitoring program cannot target every beach routinely, right? So some of these samples come from single monitoring points at a single beach every year. Some of them are monitored two times. Some of the beaches out here are monitored very frequently. Um, and so it really kind of depends um, on a kind of a risk analysis. So um, the people who decide where the beach monitoring program is going to go might say, well, the high use beaches are good places where we should be monitoring more routinely than the lower use beaches, right? Those are some of the decisions that have to be made. And just as an example, because I know this is a, a topic that's of interest here, we know that septic systems can be a, a large contributor of fecal contamination, especially human fecal contamination, um, in water sources. And so this is a study that actually came out of um, this state from Joan Rose's lab. And so she's probably a name that many of you are familiar with. She's um, you know, a global expert in, in water uh, research. Uh, and so in this study, this is just one of a number of studies that you could put in this slide. In this study, um, the study was to see uh, whether or not you could find human fecal marker in uh, 64 different rivers in Michigan. And so um, this, on the left-hand side, these are the E. coli concentrations that were detected as part of this study. Okay, and they were looking at, at just a variety of rivers. The specific river isn't really critical for my story here. And then they looked at a marker called B theta, which is a human marker. And then um, you could see that there's a number of places, number of counties that are in this red zone for B theta, which means that they're at the kind of high level of the B theta detection. And those tend to correlate pretty well with where you see um, the yellow, which are the higher um, the data points for the E. coli. And it's important to note that these samples were taken at low flow times. So this, these weren't samples that were, should have been impacted by rainwater runoff events. So this is, this is just kind of leaching contamination that's being detected here. And what they did is they also geographically mapped the density of septic systems um, in each of these different areas. And then they, they mapped the B theta concentration. So the B theta concentration is here on the Y axis and the density of septic systems is on the x-axis. And then the point here is that those samples that end up in this upper quadrant here, where you tend to have high B theta concentrations, they are almost exclusively in those areas where you have high septic system density. Okay, So this shouldn't come really as a surprise to anybody. right? We know um, that you know, US-wide, probably Michigan-wide, there's lots of um, septic systems that are old, probably not functioning very properly. 
um, and um, certainly contributing some material into the environment. And this is just one example of how that is, is certainly happening and can be detectable using a study. What's interesting, though, is that this is 64 different river samples. And um, in one of our CBM program studies that involved Glen Lake, um, where we were looking at enteric bacteria using the HF183 marker, we did many, many more um, samples just for one lake. And so um, the data points here aren't really that relevant because you can't really see them, but there are some positive spots on Glen Lake. But remember, this is a single data point, um, which, as you've seen with the swimmer's itch data set, single data points can be tricky to interpret for bigger scale kind of questions. But what I want to emphasize here is that samples were taken every 500 feet. They were tested for human enteric bacteria. And this is Little Glen Lake, and this is Big Glen Lake. And every one of these sample points was sampled and collected for uh, an enteric bacteria sample and analyzed with freshwater solutions using qPCR. And so this is just an example. This was done at other lakes, too. Lime Lake, Little Traverse Lake. Lots of different lakes had this study in 2018. And the point here isn't where the points are, positive or negative or what, whatnot. The point here is that we can increase the scale of sampling in this type of a study um, immensely over what's capable from a single research lab. And so we can get a much different spatial scale, temporal scale, on these types of questions. Joan's study from her lab is really a single time point. It's a snapshot in time. And we don't know how that might have changed if she had done her sampling earlier or later in the year. So how persistent is human fecal bacterial marker in rivers in Michigan? Well, we don't know. But we could find that out using a more community-based approach if we had sampling going on throughout those rivers persistently. So we've done a lot of enteric studies. In Alberta, we, this is one of the more hot topics that we are participating in with community-based monitoring. Lots of people are interested in enteric bacteria monitoring. Here in Michigan, just to kind of peel out um, our enteric studies for 2019, just so you can get a sense for what they look like, um, we've worked on seven lakes in Michigan um, as part of our CBM enteric study. There's about 20 sites per lake um, on, on a lot of the lakes that we're working on. They're sampled all at a single time point for this study. And again, we had these, um, the U of A and Freshwater Solutions partners and about 12 community partners taking samples. The intention of this study was to understand the contribution of runoff at the different inlet points into the lakes um, around Michigan to see what kinds of fecal material was coming into the lakes um, from those um, uh, runoff events. And so there was over 200 water samples collected. So they collected water samples at the, in, at the point where the, the stream or the river is coming into the lake and then on each side of that to get a sense for whether or not it's moving to one side or the other. And then we ran this enterococcus qPCR test, um, which is sort of our general indicator of fecal contamination. From that, we then um, ran about 400 specific qPCR tests for human marker and goose markers. We thought those would be relevant tests to run given the conditions of where we're looking in the, the question of septic and the question of maybe environmental fecal contamination. So there's a couple of little stories I'm just going to tell you related to this. I'm going to continue with the Glen Lake example just because um, they're, they they, they're, um, they're very good at collecting water samples and, and so we have lots of good data from Glen Lake. Um, so Glen Lake we sampled at a bunch of different sites um, that you can see maybe here, here, here. We had some control sites which are in yellow. The green sites were the sample sites. Um, and then that data, we can, um, I'll just highlight for you the ones that gave us enterococcus positive results. Um, so you can see um, we have these two red uh, spots here and here, which were enterococcus positive. And you can see based on the, um, the pre-rain and the post-rain data that the rainfall event certainly increased the level of fecal contamination at these sites. So we know that after a rainfall event, um, we see higher uh, general fecal contamination at these sites. And that kind of makes sense, right? Those streams are going to be bringing in material that they've collected from a whole bunch of different places. And then what's interesting is when we do the source, we didn't find the source for two of those sites, but we did find trace human um, at this site where the star is. Okay, so we know that there's some human contamination coming in there, but it's, it wasn't significant. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a worrying thing. Um, but what's noteworthy is that some of these values are approaching regulatory rec water guidelines for enterococcus. Okay? Another lake that we did some work on is Little Traverse Lake. And um, this is the data from Little Traverse Lake. So again, the yellow points are the controls, and the green points are uh, the sites where the samples were collected. The red, two red dots are where we found um, enterococcus values, with the star representing a site where we found um, some trace human values. 
um, there. And then this was one of the control sites, which also we found some enterococcus values at. Um, what's noteworthy here is you can see this is an orange value. Um, this one would have exceeded a rec water quality guideline. And so um, you got to keep in mind this is a single time point. And, and so, you know, there's lots of different work that can be done to try to expand on this story. Um, but this is, these are the kinds of things that we've been working towards um, implementing CBM for the enteric bacteria studies. And this is a, an area where I think there's a lot of interest um, to expand this kind of study going forward. Um, to ask some maybe more specific questions about different types of contaminants and where they're coming from. So for the enteric bacteria stories, I think it's really important to note that a lot of the tests that we're using in this study are established um, US EPA designed or validated tests. And so unlike the swimmer's itch tests, which are kind of like our research tests where we're doing the validation as we go and demonstrating that they work, and not, you know, there's not thousands of people using those tests worldwide. Um, these tests are well validated. So we know these qPCR tests are really good and we have really good controls to make sure that these tests are, are operating properly. Um, and these source tracking tests allow us to get a pretty high resolution for the origins of fecal bacteria at a site. The key though is that you have to remember that there's lots of different things that are pooping out in the environment, right? And so a, a, an enterococcus test is by definition going to be a bit more general. So it'll capture fecal material from birds and from dogs and from cows and from humans. But it's doing that because the interest of that test is health related, right? It's a health test. It's meant to detect a potential health risk at a site of recreation. And so if you want to get down to the source tracking kinds of questions, that's a separate question that then we need to ask. And we need to be conscious of how much DNA we use up because we might use up all of our sample. So enteric assessments can benefit from including multiple time points um, and multiple locations because once you have more time points and more spots where you're sampling, you get better resolution to answer your questions. Right? So if you have a single time point, that only tells you about what's happening at that single time point. And for, uh, as an example, if you're talking about human enteric bacteria, you might find that you know, the day you chose to have your sample time point is a rainy, kind of boring day outside. Nobody came out to the cottages that weekend, so no septic systems are being used, um, and it's kind of a slow day. If you did it on the 4th of July weekend, you might find a whole lot more because there's a lot more use. Right? And so remember that, that these tests, the, the bacteria that you're detecting, don't just kind of sit in the environment and continue to accumulate so that you can detect them later. They're not, that's not really going to be a very good test, right? Because there's going to be some human poop that gets into the water at some point, and if it just stayed there all the time, then the test would just tell you it was there, and you'd never be able to know whether new stuff was going in. So these are they're transient targets, and so you, you, you have to make sure that you're capturing them when they're there, and if you miss it, you missed it. So I think hopefully what you're kind of seeing here is that we can use CBM to try to address some of the deficiencies of a current state monitoring program where you're limited in terms of how many samples you can analyze and where you can go and stuff like that. It's not meant to replace that kind of a program, right? You wouldn't advocate that a community partner should be running QPCR to close down a beach. You would say that the community partner might run samples and if they find something that could be communicated to the right people to maybe target the state monitoring program in a, in a better way, right? You find a positive at a beach out here, you call somebody and then they say, oh, we should go test it and t test it with our test. Um, so that's how we've kind of framed it in Alberta where we've partnered with our health authority and our environmental uh, government groups to essentially try to be a sentinel network for a number of different types of biological targets. Um, having community partners running tests, then telling us, and then we validate the test results and then we tell the right person what happened. And I don't think I can emphasize enough the importance of the archiving because that allows us to go back and ask research questions. And that's really where the value for somebody like me is, is if you guys are collecting the sample and we're asking your questions, I can go back and ask a question that I want to ask about the research questions without, ha without any actual work that I have to do to go out and collect that sample, right? So the sample is invaluable. It, you can't go back in time yet and collect that water sample again. So you got it and it's the only water sample like it in, of its kind. And so that sample is invaluable. A single water sample from any of these locations, it can't be replicated again. So the final thing I want to focus on in the last couple minutes is just demonstrating um, the reliability of this approach. Because this is something that gets criticized a lot, especially when you start talking to people who are running state labs. Because rightly so, they're, they're a bit skeptical of whether or not this can be a, a tool that can be used um, and relied upon. Okay? So I want to address that question a little bit. This is a really complicated slide, but I want to I emphasize that our model here has been sort of a, an evolution from the model A to model B to model C. 
And we're kind of at this point now with Freshwater Solutions where we've, well, I mean, we've always worked on the questions together, but with the QPCR stuff, we've kind of, they have now become so comfortable with it that they're able to ask their own questions with QPCR and, and they know how to use it and, and all that. The way that we've tried to set this up though is it's kind of a flow chart diagram and I don't want you to read all the different pieces of the flow chart. What's most important is that you have this dedicated um, block here to project development. And this is the critical part of developing these types of programs is that we need to understand the desires of each partner before we move forward into actually running QPCR tests, right? And there has to be a commitment from both sides because I can't not respond to your emails if you have a question um, or your phone call if you have a question, but you also need to be sure that you're willing to commit to the time and effort that's required to run samples or collect samples or whatever that partnership might look like, right? So a couple of the big things that we want to touch on here are just um, about the reliability. So one of the big questions is, are these portable QPCR machines, how do they compare to the core machines, core QPCR machines, right? Is it, it's just a technical comparison. So the CHI um, open QPCR machine is the one that we typically disseminate around for community use. Um, there's lots of options now for this. They're all about the same price. Um, but this one is uh, kind of like a, it's built like a tank. and so. Um, it's made out of metal, it's pretty sturdy, um, you know, it just, it wears well. Um, and the software is pretty simple to use. Kelsey can maybe attest, it's not too technically challenging. And so I don't want to, I don't want to get to the details of, um, of, you know, all the different technical, um, you know, R squared and efficiencies and limit of detections and stuff like that for these qPCR tests. Um, but we're comparing these chais to um, one of the core machines that we use, which is the a rotor gene, that's the name of the PCR machine. And these are using, they're running the same samples in parallel. So the idea is how do they compare? And the point here that I want to make is that um, for many of the parameters, the R squared value, so like the, the curve itself, um, and the efficiency of the qPCR, which is ideally around two, you can see there's some slight variation between these small portable machines and the core machines. Um, the big difference that we find though in terms of the uh, type of data you get from these machines is that the limit of detection is a little bit, is you can detect m fewer DNA copies using a core machine than you can with the Chai portable machines. So this, we joke around that this is kind of like you get what you pay for, right? You, these machines, the Chais, are like 10 times cheaper than the um, core machines, and you get basically 10 times less sensitivity, one log loss of sensitivity. What that means practically, though, is that it doesn't really make a big impact on our ability to detect things that are important to detect. For example, a swimmer's jit circaria, a single circaria, has thousands of copies of our target gene because it's a multicellular organism. So the chai or a, a rotor gene can detect a single circaria in the water. Okay? So it's, it's a really a moot point if we're debating whether or not we should use the chai or the rotor gene for that kind of a detection. When we get down to bacteria, we know bacteria have, very much, they have fewer copies of the target genes that we are trying to detect. So when it comes down to those comparisons, you can kind of fall off a little bit at the very, very low end of the number of, of bacteria in your sample. If you have you know, very few bacteria in your sample, the chai might not pick it up, um, but the rotor gene might. Um, and that's where um, a lot of the runs that we've done with Freshwater Solutions have come in handy because we've been able to identify that. And there's ways that we can adjust for it by, for example, collecting a larger water sample, which then just means you have more sample there to work with. Right? So there's ways we can adjust. What we do when we do that, though, is then we're, we're essentially kind of, we're modifying the US EPA method 1611 if we do that, right? So we have to be conscious of what we're doing and how that, what that means for the comparison to a regulatory type test, right? So um, what have we learned so far? A couple more things. Um, we know that there's a bit more variation. So this, um, the variation shown here in the CBM um, partners. So I really just want you to compare this line here with this line right here. You can see the, um, the variation with our standard, our expert standard curves. Um, there's pretty little variation between our expert user, like my PhD student, Sydney. There's a little bit more variation um, in our CBM partners, but that's to be expected. And we know that as time goes on, a CBM partner gets better. So the variation between their samples gets, gets smaller and smaller and smaller as they run more and more PCRs, right? That kind of makes sense. And then if we take a look at how their values for an actual water monitoring project compare to our values, this is um, the kind of graph that we see. So I'll walk you through this, where here we just have our estimated number of circaria per sample on the y-axis. 
And then the x-axis is just, these are just all, each of these little dots is a single coup PCR run for the pan-avian schistosome assay. And the black line is the value that Sydney gets when she runs that test for the exact same DNA extract, okay? And then what we see um, based on colors is the number of um, qPCR reactions that freshwater solutions has run that fall within the 95% or the 90% or less than 90% confidence intervals of the value that Sydney got. So the idea here is that if you see a red sample point, that means that that was outside of the 90% confidence intervals. So that one was quite different from what Sydney got. My point in showing you this graph with these colors is just to really emphasize that there are a few red points, but the majority of them are dark green. So 65% um, of the samples that Freshwater Solutions ran were within the 95% confidence interval range of our results, and 91.8% 90 90 were within the 90% confidence interval of our results. Okay, so they're pretty reliable. And what's great is that there have been other groups that have done comparisons between state labs um, to see the variation in a lot of these tests between core laboratories and research labs. So this paper, the EBNTA paper, um, it is a study where they took a lot of the tests that I've already mentioned, um, the source tracking marker tests, and then enterococcus down here on the bottom. And what they did is they took the same sample and they gave it out to a whole bunch of labs, and then they said, tell us what you get. And then they, they looked at the intra-lab variation and the inter-lab variation. So they looked to see how consistent are the results from within the lab um, if they ran those samples repeatedly, and what is the um, variation between labs. And the way that they're presenting this is to show it to you as the maximum log difference between the samples. It's, it's a confusing thing to wrap your head around because a lot of the times these qPCR values are shown on a log scale. So you've got to remember you're incrementing by factors of 10, essentially. Um, but um, what this really shows you is that, for example, um, this cow M2 that I'm highlighting here has a 0.28 log maximum variation between two different core labs. Okay? So that means um, that you know, they have a pretty tight reproducibility within those labs. So um, the other thing that they show, which is really critical, is that the higher the, the copy number of your target, the more variation you tend to see. So these source tracking targets, for example, are for a very specific, usually very low abundant target bacteria. Um, but the enterococcus, like I've told you, is, is a pan kind of poop sample target, right? So it'll detect fecal, fecal bacteria, enterococcus bacteria from all different fecal sources. So, you're expecting more enterococcus bacteria in a sample than you are any of the source tr tracking tests. And what you can see, don't forget, these are all the same labs doing these studies, so it's not like there's an extra lab in there that was really bad. Um, this study shows that if you have a high target um, sample that you're analyzing, you tend to have higher variation. And that really has to do with the way qPCR works, because qPCR is exponential. And so you have exponential amplification of your target. The more target you have, even with the same amount of variation at a log scale, you're going to expect a much bigger um, difference in the actual real target you're going to detect. Okay? So where do our tests fall? Our tests tend to fall. Um, our swim resist tests tend to have about a one log variation. Okay? So slightly higher than the enterococcus tests in this, this lab. So if we compare our results in my lab to the results of freshwater solutions for the pan-avian swim resist test, we have about a one log variation, so about, um, about 0.34 log higher than this enterococcus variation between these core labs. But we're also at least 10 times higher copy number than the enterococcus test, because don't forget, swimmers at Cercaria are multicellular. Okay, so we're, we're, we're 10 times more target copy number um, than the enterococcus test, but we are also more variable. Okay? When we do our enterococcus tests, we're about 0.89 variation, log variation, if we were to use it on this scale. Um, so what that means is that w our community-based partnership with Ron and our, um, and our values, they're, they're worse than two core state labs, but I would argue that you would expect that. Um, I wouldn't expect that, that um, you know, our community partnerships and using a chai compared to a core machine and all the potential variation, shipping the sample from Michigan to Alberta, those are all elements of potential adding in a bit of variability. Um, so we're pretty, we're pretty happy with that because, like I said, we're not trying to suggest that we should be replacing state labs. Um, that would be, you know, we wouldn't get very much traction with that, I don't think. 
Um, what we are suggesting is that with that kind of reproducibility, our results are not that bad. Um, and we can rely on well-trained community partners to get pretty reliable data, especially when we're considering it as a research question. If we're not trying to close down a beach based on your data, we could easily say that the, the data we're collecting here is valuable and certainly useful from a research perspective. Okay? So I'm going to wrap up here. Um, implementing qPCR using a CBM framework works really well um, if the research partners can control for certain things. And so this is where it becomes important to have us as a bit of a partner. Because like I said, we can set up all the controls for you. We can set up a positive negative control and the standard curves in our lab, which really helps remove the likelihood that, you, that a community partner is going to contaminate you know, the standard curve and then throw all the results off and then cause a big problem. right? So um, having us play a role is still useful, but as we become bigger, then the idea is that, at, that quality control labs like Freshwater Solutions can start taking on those roles, right? So you would have a community partner here that can help set up those tests so that you don't have to continue to, you know, you don't have to get them from me. The training has to be really comprehensive. This is really important. So we have to do blind testing of our CBM partners to make sure that they're getting results that are, are accurate with tests that they don't know what they're getting, and we do. Um, and we need to integrate that into the qPCR protocol continuously. So you, you can't just do one set of blind tests and then say, yep, you're good, here you go, take it away. Um, there's always control testing. And then when we find potential issues, we have to go in and intervene and try to figure out why that issue is there. And a good example is we have this swimming pool in Edmonton that's part of our program. They're um, this kind of fancy swimming pool that I think, I, think, I know that... Um, I know that Minneapolis has one of these. They're called like a natural swimming area, natural recreation area. So it's like a pool that doesn't chlorinate, and they have these things called hydrobotanica that the water passes through that just have plants in it. And so it's a big pool. Uh, the one in Edmonton is max capacity is 900 people a day. So 900 people a day in a swimming pool that's not chlorinated. So you can imagine the potential for finding HF183 human fecal marker in that. Um, and they have a daily monitoring program that they use this exact setup for. Um, but we found that they would never see um, what we thought was going to be a very persistent target in there, Pseudomonas, which is just a, it's a bacteria that's pretty common in rec water. And we thought to ourselves, there's got to be something wrong because they're not detecting it and we're detecting it in their same samples. So Sydney went over there and said, we just got to watch what you're doing and just figure out what's happening here. And so Sydney watched and it, they, were, they were taking the DNA, they were isolating the DNA just fine, but they were pipetting the DNA, um, which is a very, very small volume, five microliters, the, it's a little tiny little drop of water. They were putting that on the side of the tube so they could see that it had gotten into the, into the tube, but the DNA was never getting into the reaction. So it was sitting on the side of the tube, but it never got into the qPCR reaction. And so they thought they were doing great, but then we, we said, oh, yeah, simple, simple correction here. You just got to just put that in there. And <laughs> problem solved. So that's where, that's where the partnership has to be really, it has to be active, right? Because the more samples that you guys would be running like that, then the less reliable your data is. And that creates a chink in the armor of the CBM program, right? Because then suddenly everyone's saying, well, you know, half your reactions aren't even working. How can we trust what you're doing? So quality control has to be a part of this. It's a critical part of it. Um, and so that's why we have the QC labs and we have our lab as another layer of QC. And we have to have consistency in the methodologies that we use to train and that we use to evaluate all the partners. Our goal is really to generate this reliable data set, right? And so the sample type and the DNA extraction, those are the areas where we know we introduce a lot of error. So if, if I use a DNA extraction method and you guys are using a different one, we're going to see a lot of variability in our tests. So we have to unify methods that work for everybody, right? Everybody has to be able to use the DNA extraction approach that we're using, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to finish up just by talking a little bit about what our vision is for CBM in Michigan. Um, you know, we um, really advocate for community participation at all stages to help answer some of these really big water questions. And um, our goal, and I think Ron has probably told every one of you this whenever he's talked to you, he will tell you Freshwater Solutions is not a water testing company. Um, we're in it for the research. And that's, I think, something we want to reiterate here is that we, we want to learn more about what's happening in the waters here in Michigan. And I think, and I think, um, I think, you know, hopefully after today a lot of this has been communicated to you that, that you can really advance understanding about water and, and come up with really novel and innovative solutions to help protect water if you understand it better. 
And if we don't understand parts of it, we need to figure out how we can. And I think community-based monitoring is one of the ways we can try to advance our understanding. Our goal really is to try to democratize water monitoring and make it more accessible to everybody so that you guys can do kind of the kind of thing that Ron presented down the road, right? I think it's, like I said, it's always important to have that, that quality control and the scientific kind of vision that's the part of this partnership. But there's nothing that would stop you if you had a QPCR machine at your lake from saying, hey, we want to see whether or not this works for swim resist control or for, you know, whatever. So those are, that, once you're comfortable, you can ask your own questions. And um, so the goal, um, a, a goal of my project in Alberta, and I think it's something that we really want to push for here too, is that we also see this as being a really important educational tool. Um, and so we want to integrate this QPCR platform, which is cost efficient and very accessible with all the training that we've, we've developed for community-based partnerships. Um, we're really interested in trying to get these things into schools so that we can use them for training students on, about QPCR and about water literacy. Um, and so this is a really big push that we're trying to, to push for as well, is to bring these things into schools, which can help bring the students into some of your questions and help them answer those questions um, using QPCR. Um, and this is also something that I think extends into even college level um, situations as well, where there's lots of, of water programs that even happen at this, uh, at this college, where um, you know, there's a lot of potential for, um, for integrating with educational um, opportunities that give people the opportunity to learn and become experts in, in water and QPCR-based monitoring, and also get your questions answered too. So there's lots of different ways this can work. And then there's certainly, I think, an ongoing educational value in advancing our science. So for freshwater solutions in the U of A, I think, um, I, think I speak for freshwater solutions on this one. I ran it by Ron. Um, you know, we're, where we think this partnership is best and what we think we bring to the table to these kinds of partnerships is we're really good at, at understanding what tools are available and what tools can be used to answer the questions that you have. We're, hope, we're hoping that we can help frame the questions that you guys might have in a way that we can integrate into this bigger picture um, type of framework um, using CBM. Um, certainly, you know, we have the training and the expertise to train people so we can help with the quality control um, and interpretation of the results, which is a big thing, right? You can always pay somebody to go and test the E. coli at your lake, but you'll get a report and then you got to do something with that. And so um, the interpretation can sometimes be a, a half the battle, right? Um, is figuring out what does this mean and how do we deal with it? And I think that then um, what I think we've shown today is that we're long-term thinkers. And so we like to do things with a longer term vision. And um, you know, sometimes that vision extends for years, but the goal is that those year long, multi year projects um, lead to something that's really awesome that we couldn't have answered without um, these kinds of partnerships. So I'm gonna leave you there. The same people were really critical for all of this that I already thanked, so I'll stop there. And I think Ron already mentioned that we do have this hour break in between from now to one o'clock. Um, so there's lots of time if you have questions. And if you wanna talk about this more, I think that's kind of the focus for this roundtable discussion that starts at one in the room mysteriously over that way somewhere. Um, so thanks again for sitting through another hour of me and um, hopefully this was exciting and useful and I'm happy to answer questions just out here because um, I think we have to vacate the room at some point. So um, thanks again everyone and 